Good morning. I'm so excited to see so many faces here. Everyone braved the CMA traffic to make it, so hopefully you'll have a great day here. Uh, but great to see so many people. Um, I'm Haley Hobius. I'm the president of the Nashville Healthcare Council. Um, so on behalf of the council and its board of directors, welcome to Nashville and the healthcare industry. Um, we have some visitors today from HHS and we're trying to show them a good time. So um, please be sure to make, give them a warm welcome. Um, let them know about the community here. Um, but one of the first things I need to do before we even get started um, is to say some thank yous. And one of the things that makes the Nashville community and industry here so special is the fact that we have people working together who are leading this community all the time. Um, we partner really well, we work together to make great things happen. Today's event would not have happened without a lot of people coming together. So I would like to thank the Nashville Technology Council, the Nashville Entrepreneur Center, Tennessee Hymns, Life Science Tennessee, the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce, and the Center for Medical Interoperability, along with my team, the Nashville Healthcare Council team, um, for all the work that has gone into making today happen. We really couldn't do this without these kinds of partnerships. And we're thrilled that HHS has identified Nashville as a city and a community that they want to come and visit. Um, I think that's a sign of where Nashville is and where it's headed, um, and hopefully the HHS team will end today with an even better understanding of the community here and all of the work that's going into innovation and healthcare in Nashville. Um, I just have to give a few stats before we get started. Um, for those who are from Nashville, you know that um, Nashville's a really unique place. Um, the healthcare, the depth of healthcare talent and knowledge in this community is unrivaled anywhere else. I often say you can't throw a rock in Nashville, Tennessee without hitting someone that is doing healthcare. So um, from that actual standpoint, we are doing amazing things here. We have a connectivity that you don't see anywhere else. And then the ability to scale actual innovations that are gonna make healthcare better across the nation is, is unparalleled. Um, so from that perspective, if you just look at it, um, CMAs are right now, most people, if you're not in healthcare, think about Nashville and they think about country music. And country music's about a $10 billion economic impact every year to the community. Um, healthcare is actually about a $38.8 billion economic impact. So it's roughly four times the size of the music industry, and it employs about 250,000 people in the Nashville area and an MSA of about 2 million people. On a local level, there are 18 publicly traded companies here. Those publicly traded companies do about $84 billion in revenue, and they employ 500,000 people globally. And these numbers are actually growing all the time because our healthcare industry here is growing all the time. Um, as we move ahead and continue to think about the growth of Nashville, um, venture capital investing um, is growing at about triple the national average here. Um, and a lot of that is fueled by the investment in healthcare dollars. So this is a really important part of our community. We're really excited that y'all are here to learn about it. Um, and we're excited to have a day to talk about this. So um, just a few things beyond the numbers that I just told you, um, really the spirit of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurism and collaboration here in Nashville um, is something really special. And I think people who come here and get to experience that and those of you have, who have moved here from other places, I hope are experiencing that every day. Um, the Healthcare Council is certainly excited to be a part of that community and we want to encourage the collaboration and the innovation in, in hopes that it continues for many, many years here. We're proud that the community has the ability to shape healthcare across the country. So I hope you'll join me also in thanking our sponsors for today. Um, we really couldn't make events like this happen um, without their help. So in terms of today's sponsoring, our supporting sponsor is HCA TriStar Health. Our associate sponsors, Am Surge. Sherard, Roe, Voigt, and Harbison. And finally, Launch Tennessee, in recognition of their contributions to the Small Business Innovation Research Matching Program. And with that said, and all the thank yous done, it's my honor to introduce our guest of honor for the day, Ed Simcox, Deputy CTO for the US Department of Health and Human Services, who's leading the efforts of outreach on behalf of entre entrepreneurs throughout the country. Ed, please join us. Good morning. Can you hear me all right? So uh, I know uh, some of you are probably disappointed uh, to see me up here. 
Uh, my boss, Bruce Greenstein, the Chief Technology Officer for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, was supposed to be here today, but you're stuck with me. Um, Bruce left uh, employment, federal employment, uh, last Friday and has moved back into the private sector and he, uh, he's going to be doing some amazing things. He's going to work for a, a home health care company that is really uh, changing uh, the way home health care is done in the United States. Um, before I get going, I, I just want to thank the, the, uh, the Nashville uh, Health Care Council. I also really want to thank uh, Haley and her team. We, this is the fourth one of these that we've done. Um, in the United States, these, these startup days. And I, I will tell you, this one is the most tightly run, professionally run one that we've, uh, that we've had so far. And uh, don't tell our friends in Chicago and, and Boston that I said that, because they did a great job too, but um, congratulations and thank you very much for, for all the hard work. These, these events are, uh, um, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into uh, you know, putting these on, so thank you. So, you may be asking, if you're not familiar with HHS, what the heck is HHS coming to Nashville for? Uh, why am I here today? And th the answer is uh, pretty simple. There's a, uh, there's a uh, really interesting country music festival happening this week. <laughs> so, um, you know, I wanted to figure out how I could travel on, on the taxpayer's dime to come hear some good music. So, thank you for uh, having me in your wonderful city. So, the real reason that we uh, chose Nashville as number four, at, you know, basically at, at the top of our list, is because of the incredible entrepreneurial scene that you have here, um, especially in healthcare. And uh, you know, Haley, um, you know, mentioned uh, some of the superlative, um, you know, statistics that you have um, in, in your community. And it, it, as you're probably aware, your, your reputation precedes you, you know, across the United States. So that's something to uh, to be proud of. Uh, so for all of you that are involved in healthcare, um, and especially in healthcare innovation, thank you for doing that and continue the great work that you're doing, um, especially around collaboration. The culture here is different than it is in a lot of major cities and, and regions in the United States. And if you're in uh, the healthcare provider business, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There are um, places where you cannot get leadership from two health, you know, even faith-based nonprofit healthcare provider systems in the same room, much less collaborating in a meaningful way. Um, and what we see here is much different. We had folks uh, at dinner last night, uh, C, uh, CIOs and innovators, um, who, who really showed um, an amazing amount of collaboration and, and warmth. And my understanding is that that happens um, throughout the city and throughout this region. So that's fantastic. Okay, we're just on this screen down here, huh? Okay, gotcha. Okay, so a little bit of background on uh, why Bruce and I um, decided, to, decided to do these startup days. Um, I, in my career, I've, I've, I've held multiple positions and I've, I've tried to collaborate with HHS in the past. At one time, I was working for AT&T and uh, was working with startups that were interested in leveraging AT&T network um, and, uh, to come out with innovative medical devices uh, and wellness devices. Um, and they wanted to be able to um, leverage the cloud to, to, to upload telemetry data, health data, and, and, and so on. And um, so I worked a lot with these companies, these early stage companies. I, I, I looked at their business plans, you know, and, and helped them, you know, think through, hey, if you're going to be uh, working with a large carrier, you know, here's some ideas on, on um, you know, how you can probably accelerate uh, your success. Um, but what was really interesting is um, as AT&T began to think about ways that uh, um, we could help these companies either by make, may, maybe making some nominal investments in those companies um, or uh, granting them um, maybe some special ask, ac access to, to, to network, um, we, 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 we started to bump up against uh, HHS, in particular uh, FDA. And what we found was that it, that, that it was very difficult to interface with, with FDA at the time. Um, and we were a very, very large, uh, 
you know, large company. So, like a lot of big companies, AT&T has a lot of lawyers. Uh, they have uh, about 800 lawyers, actually, between full-time employees as well as uh, full-time retainered, uh, you know, contracted attorneys. And uh, so I started making the rounds. I went to the general counsel's office and asked them for um, a little bit of information. Uh, I said, hey, I, I'm interested in, in finding a, a lawyer here at AT&T that's worked with the FDA or understands the, the vetting process, the review process um, that uh, the FDA asks for uh, medical device manufacturers to go through. And uh, there wasn't a single attorney that understood it. So then the advice that was given to me was you need to go hire a consultant to be able to penetrate FDA, okay? That's the first anecdote I wanted to tell you. The second anecdote is that when I started, the, the second day I was at HHS, my boss, Bruce, um, yelled, Simcox! That's, if you know Bruce, you know, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. He's, he's high energy, uh, and he's a super guy, um, and he likes to yell in the office. Right? <laughs> so, um, so anyway, he yells my name. I come in his office, and he, he said, hey, um, I, I want you to be in this next meeting with me. I know it's not on your calendar, um, but this will be very interesting. And so I said, yeah, sure. What, what, what's it about? And he says, well, th there's a company coming in, um, but there's also a former US senator that's going to be coming in. I said, oh, that's great. So we sit down. And um, these folks come in his office, and, and it was a very ceremonial type of a, a scene. And, and uh, the, the short of it is that this company felt that it was so hard to interact with HHS, even our office, even the office of the CTO, which is known as being kind of an outward-facing uh, office within the federal government. Um, it was so, they, they felt it was so difficult to penetrate that they hired a former US senator to get to us. So that, that's, that's why we started this, this uh, set of startup days, was to, was to interact with you all, or y'all. Uh, <laughs> I'm from Indiana, uh, so hopefully I said that right. But, um, it, but that's what it's about, right? So it's, it's, really, it's really to be able to interface with everybody across the nation um, and, and, and really stimulate innovation in, in the uh, healthcare industry. Healthcare innovation should not be limited to large incumbents. Um, I, I know that there are some folks that are representing large um, organizations uh, here. We, we welcome you. We know that you all are doing uh, really, really innovative, great work. I spend a lot of time talking uh, to folks that work for large providers and, and payers. And um, I'll tell you, there's a ton of innovation coming out of this space. But where we really want to also focus is um, on the early stage companies, people that have these great ideas, but they've, they've just kind of given up. You know, they, 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 they've maybe whiteboarded for a while, uh, maybe they've talked to mentors of theirs, maybe they've gone into kind of the incubator community to, to fish around for how they might be able to bring something to market. And, and what they're told sometimes is, hey, forget about it. You know, it's gonna be FDA regulated device, and how are you gonna get it paid for by CMS? Um, so these are things that are very important to us. We need to figure out how to address those. So um, it's really important for us, uh, you know, large incumbents have enough uh, money and enough expertise and enough maturity as an organization uh, to be able to, to get to us, but a lot of times smaller companies don't. So as we traveled around, we heard different things uh, from the people that we were meeting with, especially, you know, small companies. And, when I was on the outside, I had a lot of these perceptions as well. Number one, um, it takes you guys so long to make up your mind about things. It takes us so long to get through trials, trials with FDA. It takes us so long to, to figure out how we might be able to get paid by CMS. Um, and this is a, a common refrain. Um, number two, we don't always understand what you want from us. We don't understand the process to get to you. We don't know if the products that we're coming out with mean anything to you because we really don't interact with you. Number three, your processes seem Byzantine. Um, it, we, it, it's almost like you hide your process from us on purpose. And, and, it's, and, it, and it's difficult uh, to navigate. And, and, you know, I, I actually was pretty cynical about it. I, I, I thought that maybe, you know, people hid process on purpose. 
um, uh, to just just because they were so busy and and didn't you know didn't want for me to be successful in penetrating the organization. I will tell you though that's not so. And number four, um, gosh, why are we hiding contacts of, of, of folks, right? And we're gonna you're gonna hear from two people uh, today representing uh, the National Institutes of Health as well as uh, CMS um, about what. Um, uh, you know, they're, they are going to be able to uh, interface with you and, and um, as an example of how you can actually talk to folks in government. And, and we are very interested in the office of the CTO in, in helping you penetrate um, this huge agency, HHS. So really we want to um, open the doors to you um, but more importantly, from my, ask, from my perspective, that's Bruce, by the way. Um, more importantly, it, I get really energized when I interact with folks. Um, I was, I, I, we had a fantastic dinner last night, and we took time for, for folks to ask me questions, and, and, and we were able to interact. And um, I think that's more important, a lot more important than you hearing from me. So I hope there's an opportunity for uh, me to meet a lot of folks in the room today and, and for us to interact. And if not, I, I freely give out my contact information and I would love to interact with you um, or put you with some folks that might be able to answer questions or facilitate some business that you have going on. So um, the future is bright. The future is bright for everybody that is doing innovation in healthcare. Um, you know, in the first half of 20, 2017, um, we saw $3.5 billion um, in aggregate across 188 digital uh, health companies. That's, that's a lot of value. Uh, compound annual growth rate over a five-year period of 32%. That's amazing. Um, you know, there are a ton of 100 plus million deal, uh, dollar deals um, in, in the last year, as you're probably aware, if you're in, in the, um, um, if you're in the investment business. Um, let me turn and, and talk to you a little bit more about HHS. Oops. So HHS is the largest civilian agency in the world from a balance sheet perspective. Um, so uh, you know, over a trillion dollar uh, annual budget. I'm not even sure how many zeros that is, but it's, it's a lot. Um, uh, 80,000 employees and even more uh, contracted full-time uh, full equivalents. Um, many of you are familiar with uh, some of these organizations. So uh, CMS, um, which, is, which runs Medicare and Medicaid. Um, so think, think of CMS, if you're not in the business, think of CMS as a uh, kind of a two-pronged um, organization. It's, it's a large insurance company paying for health care, and it's, and it's also a, a policy shop uh, slash regulatory shop. FDA, Food and Drug Administration, right? So um, the, by the way, these, these agencies that you see up here pretty much touch every American every day, right? Um, whether it's, you know, it's food, it's the food that you're eating, the drugs you're taking, the disease that's being prevented in your community, or if you're, if you're grappling with disease, it's being studied, um, you know, uh, uh, very earnestly and diligently. Um, and, and so anyway, F FDA and then NIH, the National Institutes for Health, um, is the, the, the world's uh, most renowned scientific organization. Um, and they are doing fantastic things across many, many disease states. They're also doing amazing things with data and the National Library for Medicine. Um, they're doing things uh, around interoperability. Um, and they're, they also have deep, deep pockets of, of innovation. So business type innovation, process innovation, uh, and um, process innovation, and of course, uh, innovation in care. And then the CDC, right, uh, located in Atlanta um, with um, offices all over the United States. Um, is, is all about uh, disease control. So, um, how can we possibly innovate in one of the ugliest buildings uh, in Washington, D.C.? 
Um, I, I had the wonderful experience of being able to go into the uh, Capitol Dome um, uh, in the Capitol uh, not too long ago. And, uh, and I, you know, I looked, I peered out over the mall, and there were all these people walking around, and there was a little protest going on over here. And I mean, it, it was just so neat to, uh, to be able to look all the way down the mall and you know, all the way you know, throughout throughout the city. But the one thing that kind of bummed me out was when I saw this. It, it actually, <laughs> and I work here, it actually uh, looks a little bit like a spaceship uh, when, you, when, you, when you see it from above. Uh, it's, it's, it kind of sticks out. You have all these beautiful uh, congressional office buildings and then you have HHS. Um, and people say it's, it's probably the, the second uh, ugliest building in Washington uh, not to be outdone by uh, housing and urban development. <laughs> and hopefully the irony is uh, not lost on you there. Let's talk a little bit about what we do. So our mission is to um, create an intersection of data, innovation, and technology to improve health outcomes as well as agency performance. Um, that's, that's, that's pretty simple. And we're doing a lot of different um, initiatives and projects around this. First, I want to touch on our, our internal innovation. And this was really the genesis of our office. Okay, So if you go back to the last presidential administration, um, that's when the office of the CTO was created. And the first CTO was a, a guy named Todd Park, who uh, hope, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have heard speak before. You may have even met him. I know he was recently in uh, Nashville. And, um, and Todd was instrumental at, at doing something really, really well, and that was giving voice to, to data, if you will, and liberating data, okay? Um, there is a ton of data across federal government that is hidden away, and uh, there are lots of very uh, well-meaning, well-intentioned, earnest data custodians, if you will, throughout federal government, and especially within uh, HHS that are very mission-driven but they see that primary use of the data sometimes as the only use of the data. And what Todd did is he gave voice to, the, to the, the idea that the secondary use of this data and getting it in the hands of other people is just as valuable, if not more valuable, than that primary use of the data, right? So uh, he did great things there. There were two other CTOs uh, during the last administration that built on that, okay? So, the, the second CTO did a, a great thing, and he set up an internal innovation office, uh, which became known as the, the Idea Lab. And the idea there was to, uh, to instill innovation inside uh, HHS and, and, and have uh, good ambassadors for innovative techniques and business practices, design thinking, and so on, um, and, and, and uh, pull people in from our agencies and put them through a boot camp and, 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 and give them a, a good framework to work with and then have them go back into their agencies and starburst this, this new way of thinking and doing business in the federal government. And it's been uh, very, very successful. We have a lot of success stories around that. And the idea here is, you know, um, we have an innovation day at HHS. You know, it's once a year. But the idea really was to create some sustainability around uh, innovation at HHS. So it's an internal innovation hub, um, and it, we, we, we have people come in. We, we actually put out a call uh, for ideas. And a lot of times, these are folks that have been working in our agencies for a long, long time. Or maybe there are people that just started a year or two prior. And, and, this is, it, it, and they know that there's a business problem, but they can't figure out how to solve it because it may not be directly related to the mission, and they may be very, very busy. And what we're able to do is give them some air cover or some safe space to come and innovate around that idea and, and use innovative ways to solve uh, pressing business problems. Let's turn really quick to outward innovation. So um, we just talked about kind of the inward uh, stuff that our office does. Um, when we came in um, last year, we, we really wanted to look at ways that we could use this office. Uh, we sit in the immediate office of the secretary, so we have a, a view, a bird's eye view, across um, all of our agencies. And we wanted to see if there was a way that we could take the good work that had been done by the previous CTOs and build on that. 
So the first thing I want to tell you about is a project. Um, it's really a first of its kind. And um, it's, it's a public-private partnership. And uh, it's called, uh, we're calling it Kidney X. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, kidney disease, if you don't know. It's a pretty big deal. So um, there's been very little innovation uh, in dialysis in the last 50 years. And dialysis is the way that we, uh, when, when, when you lose your kidney function over time, at some point, your body is not able to, uh, to filter toxins out of your system, basically. So, um, so what we do is we have a renal treatment called dialysis, right? There are two types of dialysis. Um, Medicare spends $35 billion a year on dialysis. That's a lot of money. That is, a, is, is equivalent to 1% of the entire federal budget just to you know, put that in context, right? Super big problem in the United States. And, and the numbers of people on dialysis are growing. Um, and our outcomes are not that good either, right? So dialysis as a treatment, you know, most, you know, greater than 60% of the patients die after five years on dialysis, right? So um, this, this is a, a pressing problem for us, and, and we know that there's innovation going on out there, but it's not bubbling up, and we couldn't figure out why. So what we did is, is we developed an accelerator program. We call it Kidney X. It's a public-private partnership with the uh, American Society of Nephrology. And uh, the idea is, is really we want to create a way to uh, address this through um, you know, stimulating innovation around prevention, diagnostics, and treatment of kidney disease. So we're, we're set, we've set up a fund, and we're doing a series of prize uh, challenges focused on um, you know, these, these aspects that I mentioned. And um, the idea is there, it's, it's, a, it's a milestone process, milestone dependent. It's a non-dilutive type of investment available um, to these companies. Um, and the whole idea here is to de-risk, de-risk the market uh, so that people that are innovating in this space aren't faced with so much risk. Am I going to get my, uh, my product through the regulatory environment? Am I going to be able to um, penetrate uh, a market that is, uh, the, uh, that is the dialysis market um, that is largely controlled by uh, two uh, companies in, in the market and so on? So lowering, lowering the barrier, barrier to entry. And in so, you know, when we were doing research, we found some really interesting uh, legislation, some really interesting authorities that allow us to do it. And so we're operating it under the authority that you see there on the screen. So we want to we wanna completely disrupt uh, the world of kidney disease. We think that we are at a place now where uh, technology um, allows us to do this. And, and again, we want to de-risk de um, the market so that VCs become more interested in, in funding, uh, you know, funding companies that are coming up with uh, uh, new innovative ways to address the, these issues. So that's just, that's an example of, of um, kind of the outward facing innovation that we're stimulating. Um, I want to hit on two but, uh, Blue Button 2.0 really quickly. This is a big deal. Um, I'm going to get a little techie on you for a second, so I apologize. One of, the, one of the things that our administration firmly believes, um, and our secretary, is that patients need to be, they need to be making informed decisions about their health care, their health. And to do that, they need access to data, not just anecdote. They need, you know, you can't, you can't manage what you can't measure, and we need to give at least some really basic opportunities for folks to measure uh, their health and, and progress. So um, Blue Button 2.0 is, um, is a revamp of, of Blue Button. And the, and the idea here is, uh, well, so Administrator Seema Verma of CMS announced this at, at HEMS, at the HEMS conference this year, um, to, to quite a bit of uh, enthusiasm. Uh, from the crowd, and the idea is we want to give developers, app developers, API access to live Medicare data so that they can then go write apps to place that data um, on the devices of patients, 
That's, that's what it comes down to. So the idea here is to, to leverage some uh, industry standards, right? So fire uh, plus an authentication method uh, plus uh, smart on fire. Um, and the idea is to give, again, beneficiary data uh, back to the beneficiaries, back to the patients. There's a sandbox setup, so if you think about like an Amazon um, a cloud type of a setup or any of the large cloud providers, um, there's, there's a, a, a dev environment uh, where, you can, where you can actually run against the API, run against test data, and uh, when you're ready to go, uh, you can have your app reviewed. Um, and uh, the, the hope is, the SLA um, hope is that we're able to get your app reviewed and approved within two weeks. That's kind of unheard of in government. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about Blue Button 2.0. This is another example of some external innovation that our office is, is helping on. We've already had, um, uh, we already have 100 app developers hitting this API in prod now, in production. We have hundreds of others that are in test and, and, are, and are applying to be a part of this program. And uh, if you, is, is anybody in here hitting the API today? Okay, so, so um, highly uh, encourage uh, folks to, to go check this out if, if, you, uh, if you have any ideas on how to liberate data and, and, and create some patient apps for us. I want to touch just briefly, I know I'm probably running over here, I want to touch, want to touch briefly on our, on our secretary's priorities. Um, combating the opioid crisis, bringing down the price of prescription drugs. You've probably heard about this in the media recently. The, our, our secretary, he comes from the pharmaceutical industry. He kind of knows how, you know, where the bones are buried and he kind of understands um, you know, how, how things work there. And he's very earnest in, in bringing down the cost of drugs, I will tell you that. Um, there, there, there are a lot of intricacies, a lot of complexities associated with, with doing that. Um, um, but uh, we are gonna get that done. And a lot of that has to do with uh, transparency of data, right? So, and then addressing the cost and availability of health insurance, and finally transforming our healthcare system to a value-based system, where people see the value in the care that they're giving and, and, and are empowered to make decisions around um, um, the, the value that's rendered, as well as, uh, uh, you know, uh, payers, the people that are paying for that care, the insurance companies that are paying for that care, uh, being able to, to assess um, the, the, the actual care that is rendered in a meaningful way. We held an, so, so I mentioned opioids. This is top of mind for everybody, right? We held the, the first ever opioid sym symposium in Codathon. The idea was to connect um, uh, folks at HHS and, 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 and elevate high value data sets and expose those data sets to industry and to people that are creating solutions uh, for the, the opioid problem in the United States. Um, and it was a fantastic event. We created the, the world's largest opioid uh, centric, opioid specific um, uh, set of data. And uh, we, we surfaced that and we had folks come in and, and, and basically did an overnight coding session, a, a hackathon, a codathon. And out of that came some fantastic ideas, some, some, some solutions that we never thought of. And really, it, it was a real success for us because it really opened our eyes. There are a lot of earnest people trying to solve this in their communities, you know, the community level, the city level, the state level. And um, what it did is it created this kind of an instant commu uh, community, if you will, of folks that we now interact with very regularly. And we can call on folks um, and, and ask them questions and they can, they can talk to us as well. So together, we're all kind of coming together around this um, and uh, creating a lot of value and trying to accelerate uh, solutions to this to this epidemic. So um, firmly believe that this, th this, is, uh, this is really important. So what we're really trying to do is attract folks like you in the room to come help focus on national problems. And as you know, if you're in healthcare, you already are focused on a national problem, right? People are getting sicker. Our population is, is aging. 
at, at a very, very rapid pace. We're trying to figure out how to keep people in their homes longer and out of uh, you know, uh, care settings, keep them independent. And we're, we're trying to bend the cost curve of healthcare. These are big, big pressing problems. We want to lower the barriers to entry. We want to lower the amount of red tape. We want to give you access to your government uh, so that you can innovate. And that's really what we're all about, and that's what we get excited about. So anyway, here's, my, uh, here's our contact information. I have cards available. I thought my, actually thought my, uh, my email was on there. But I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, get with you. You can um, contact us um, on social as well as email. Uh, and uh, this can certainly get routed to me, or you know, feel free to come up to talk to me. Listen, thank you, thank you very much for, for having us here. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to spend a day with us. Uh, we're really excited to be here, and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, and good morning. I can tell you that uh, after getting to know Ed a little better last night, um, nothing against Bruce, but that's old news. I think we're very fortunate to have Ed here. Uh, he brings not only extensive experience in healthcare, but I learned last night is actually a musician, has a music tech startup in his background. I think when you get done in Washington, D.C., that there's an open invitation to Nashville for you to come join us. I'm Brian Moyer, president of the Nashville Technology Council, and we're pleased to host this event along with our other community partners. The Greater Nashville Technology Council represents about 400 company members across the Middle Tennessee area. We're, um, we're glad to serve as an enabler for healthcare and the other industry leaders that we have in town, uh, and to be a part of this particular uh, event driving innovation within healthcare, which is certainly an important topic in Nashville. We're regularly noted as um, one of the top 10 tech communities in the nation as far as growth. Forbes ranked us as seventh, Money Magazine ranked us as eighth, or vice versa, but it was seventh and eighth. Um, the Kauffman Foundation, in addition, recently uh, ranked us as fifth in the country as far as the growth of entrepreneurial activity. So there's a lot happening here, and I think it's uh, very appropriate that you're expanding this particular uh, event to the Nashville area. As far as other uh, noteworthy news from the Technology Council, just want to share, and some of you that, uh, that attend of our, our, our other events may be tired of hearing me talk about this, but we had a soft launch last week of our Tech Apprenticeship Program. So it is live, the portal's live, people can go in and start uh, taking the assessment. There will be more press about that in the, in the coming weeks, but as promised, second quarter of this year, we're, we're up and going with our Tech Apprenticeship Program. Now I'm pleased to introduce Anna Mazuko, Special Assistant to the Principal Deputy Director of the National Institutes of Health. That's almost as long as Peter's title. Um, Prior to joining the NIH Office of the Director, Anna was at the National Eye Institute Office of the Director, where since 2015 she focused on the development of special programs and initiatives, coordinating a working group of the National Advisory Eye Council for the NEI Director. Anna began her federal career as an American Association for the Advancement of Science and Science and Technology Policy Fellow, spending time in both the NEI Office of the Director and Division of extramural science programs. Prior to that, she was scientific advisor at the Cancer Prevention and Treatment Fund, where she worked on policy issues related to cancer research and public health. Please join me in welcoming Anna. I forgot I've got the lapel mic. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for having me today. And um, I can say that I, I shared the privilege of attending one of these startup days um, with two of my other colleagues uh, who attended in uh, Chicago and earlier this year. And we were all fighting over who was going to get to go to Nashville. So I won to be able to come today. So thank you for having me. Um, so let's see if I can get this working. OK. 
Um, so I'm here just to tell you a little bit about the National Institutes of Health and also I think just try to um, describe how, you know, what NIH does is relevant and of interest to the small business community. I think when people think of the NIH, they tend to think of academic research only, but we have a lot more than that. Um, and so I'm hoping just to give you a little, a little background um, and what might be relevant uh, for this community. Oops. Okay. So yes, here we go. Okay, just want to make sure I got the first slide here. So the National Institutes of Health, we are the nation's steward of medical and behavioral research. Um, so that's a big job. Um, the interesting thing about the NIH is that we kind of have this two-sided nature. Um, we actually do our own research, so in that way I think we're still really in touch with um, what scientists do um, making discoveries because NIH has its own internal uh, research program, which about 30% of our budget goes to that. Uh, but then I think the thing that we're really known for is supporting research of non-federal scientists. So that's an academic researcher at a university. Um, that could be a hospital, a medical school, a training program, both in the United States and also overseas. Um, we're responsible for helping, helping to train um, scientific investigators, so the next generation of um, science in the U.S. Uh, we're responsible for fostering communication on medical information, um, the National Library of Medicine, as was mentioned before. And uh, we're very proud of the fact that um, we sponsor a lot of scientific uh, research and breakthroughs, so 153 NIH researchers have become uh, Nobel laureates as of 2017. Uh, just a little bit more background as to kind of our structure, because it may seem a little bit opaque. Um, so the National Institutes of Health is kind of this umbrella, and underneath that there's actually 24 institutes who get direct appropriations from Congress for their annual budget. And so you can see um, in this diagram here all of those institutes and centers which all together make up the National Institutes of Health. And briefly, just as I mentioned, this slide just kind of shows you um, the breakdown that NIH is an institution. We have about 6,000 scientists on our campus um, just outside Washington, D.C., and we also support institutions and people. That's what we call our extramural research program. Um, more than uh, 2,500 institutes and more than 300,000 scientists and research personnel are supported by NIH funding. Uh, I think the other thing that the NIH might be known for is that um, as part of our own internal uh, research program, we have a hospital on campus, um, which is actually the largest clinical research center in the world. Um, sorry about that. There it is. Um, and it admits patients uh, that are under um, participating in clinical trials. Um, patients can be referred to us either by their physician if they're participating in a study or they can self refer refer through the clinicaltrials.gov website, and there are about, currently about 1,500 clinical studies in progress at the clinical center at the NIH, and there are 40,000 languages translated to support uh, globally um, people who come to us for clinical trials, so there's that component as well, so it's a busy place. As I mentioned, um, just the breakdown of how NIH funding is distributed about um, our FY 2018 budget is $37 billion. About 30% of that is, is at NIH for the internal research programs I described, and the rest of it is all going outside to support outside investigators who come to us for funding, and that includes our small business portfolio, which I will talk about next. And just to give you a little sense of how NIH interacts um, with the outside world, researchers of all different types, um, so basically, if you want to write an application to get funding um, from the NIH, uh, the first person you'd probably interact with, we refer to them as your program officer. That's, these are the, the NIH staff who actually manage all the research portfolios and uh, manage the actual grants. 
So a researcher would interact with a program officer at NIH, develop a grant application, submit uh, the application to the NIH where it would undergo a peer scientific review process. Uh, final uh, funding decisions are made um, by the individual institutes at the NIH, uh, and that's a process which involves uh, the institute's national advisory councils, which serve as a resource and advisory um, group for that each institute, and then the institute director um, makes the final decisions to allocate funds and also provide an annual justification to Congress as to um, how our uh, funding was used every fiscal year. So um, just to give you a, a little um, flavor of NIH's impact on health and medicine in the United States, this graph just shows um, U.S. life expectancy over the last about 60 years. And we can just point out um, that cardiovascular disease death rates have fallen more than 70% over this period of time, and cancer death rates are now falling by more than 1% each year, and each 1% drop saves about $500 billion in healthcare costs. And uh, HIV therapies enable people in their 20s to live up to past 70 years. So this is just kind of a few um, snapshots of the progress that's been made in this area, which NIH has been involved in. Just um, a little bit more, some numbers as far as the impact of NIH research on the U.S. economy. In 2017, NIH research supported more than 400,000 jobs at more than 2,500 institutions and small businesses nationwide. In 2017, NIH funding generated $69 billion in new ec economic activity. That's more than double the taxpayer's investment. And NIH serves as the foundation for really the entire U.S. medical sector, um, considering that it employs more than 1 million U.S. citizens, generates 84 billion in wages and salaries, and exports 90 billion in goods and services every year. And just to show um, a, a little snapshot of um, small businesses that have been funded by NIH, uh, these are a few um, companies that, that have interacted with NIH and got their start um, with our small business programs. So to talk a, a little bit more about the small business um, programs at the NIH, since that's really our theme for today, I can say that out of the $37 billion um, for our annual NIH budget, almost $1 billion of that is set aside for small business and small um, business technology transfer research. Um, and we can't spend this money on anything else. This has to be spent on small business innovation research or small business technology transfer research. And to talk uh, just a little bit more about um, the specifics of the type of small business programs we have that we fund, um, we fund basically um, small business in phase one, phase two, and phase two B. So we cover kind of the whole gamut, starting with feasibility in phase one, full research and development in phase two, and up through phase 2B, which is really right on the cusp of commercialization. Um, and there's two specific programs I want to note, which we'll, we'll show on the next slide, some more information. Um, within these small business programs, there's a niche program that um, accepts, accepts applications from all HHS phase 1 awardees. And this program specifically provides market insight and data that can help um, Small businesses strategically position their technology in the marketplace, and it helps them develop their commercialization, commercialization plan. And there's also the commercialization accelerator program called CAP, um, which we also have. Um, we do that in partnership with NIH, CDC, and FDA. And there are about 80 slots per year um, for that program. Awardees can apply, and the point of this program is really to establish market relevance and begin to implement a commercialization plan, and uh, the awardees for this, this program received, bu received business uh, relevant mentoring and also pitch coaching to really teach them how to communicate to potential investors. Uh, phase three is not funded by the NIH, um, but at this point, um, 
companies that have gone through this program, we're hoping that by the time they get to phase three, they're really well positioned to be able to uh, solicit additional support for their work. Um, but just a little bit more details on, on these phases. Phase one, um, the feasibility, feasibility study phase, those awards are usually about a year long, and they're usually, the budget for those is usually in the range of $225,000. Phase two, which is the full uh, research and development phase, requires a commercialization plan, and those awards are usually 1.5 million over two years. And the phase 2B program is usually up to 3 million total for an award, and that's usually spread over three years, about 1 million in support per year. Um, and I should note, not all the institutes and centers at the NIH participate in that program, and some institutes require a strategic partner for these awards who can bring financial and business know-how to the table and help. Um, enhance the chance of success, but NIH does have these programs, and I know some really great um, SBIR program officers that I'm happy to talk offline with people, um, but we are very proud of our contribution in this area, um, and it is a very active um, part of the NIH portfolio. So just to show you our front door for people who are interested in these and um, you know, I hope in the spirit of, of today's meeting just to try to show you entryways into you know, these processes that you can um, contact us and get more information on these programs that are relevant uh, for small business. This is kind of the, the gateway for all small business programs at the NIH. Um, and uh, I'm going to show a couple slides further on, which will show you how you can even search um, to look for what's in the NIH portfolio in different areas currently that's currently being funded, how you can identify a program officer who would have expertise in a particular area to consult with. Um, so I'm going to try to kind of um, shed some light on, on ways uh, in uh, to these programs. Um, and just to um, pivot for a minute, um, and this kind of ties in um, with Kidney X, which was mentioned um, by Ed, um, falls in, in line with these types of programs, um, which have really kind of uh, taken off at NIH recently. Um, in 2010, uh, the America Competes Act was passed, and in 2016, the America Competitive Competitiveness and Innovation Act was passed, and those really um, serve to give federal authorities, um, federal agencies prize authority to basically do um, prize competitions. Um, they also encourage public-private partnership, commercialization, and cross-discipline interactions, and they come with the eligibility to actually win um, cash prizes. And so I'm going to talk a little bit, just a couple examples of recent um, challenge awards that NIH has done. So, oops, sorry, there we go. So um, one of them, which is actually near and dear to my heart, um, because before I uh, came to the NIH Office of the Director, I was actually at the National Eye Institute, and um, we just finished phase one of our 3D retina organoid challenge. Um, so uh, the winner um, was announced last fall, and we're now actually in phase two of that challenge. And the idea of this challenge um, was basically um, for either an academic or a small business entity to develop a 3D um, model of the human retina that could be useful for disease modeling or drug development purposes. Um, another example um, was the single cell analysis challenge. Um, several finalists um, were selected last summer for that, and they were able to develop new tools to predict and analyze behavior of single cells in complex tissue over time. Uh, another example um, was a wearable alcohol biosensor uh, development challenge. And lastly, a, a recent one um, from the National Cancer Institute was called Up for a Challenge, Stimulating Innovation in Breast Cancer Epidemiology, where um, the competitors had access to health data and uh, were challenged to come up with new modeling um, that could be tested um, 
to explain breast cancer susceptibility based on genomic data sets, and that was at the National Cancer Institute. So these are just a, a smattering of some of the prize competitions that um, have been supported at NIH recently, but I think there's a lot of excitement um, in terms of being able to do some really innovative things, um, and it's a different, um, a different approach to the typical um, academic research grant that you would usually think of as being funded by the NIH. So, and just to show you, I had mentioned um, we have um, a website where you can go in and basically look um, all the public information that's available on the NIH uh, research portfolio, so you can look and see what we're currently funding in a lot of different areas and break it down by grant mechanism, topic, institute, um, all sorts of things. Um, so this is called the NIH uh, reporter system, and it's a public-facing public website um, where you can go in. Um, uh, there's a lot of different search options and ways that you can slice and dice the data. For example, um, you can just do a text search, um, put in uh, some information about your scientific topic and basically search and it will return to you a whole set of data uh, looking across the NIH portfolio, what we currently fund in that area, what types of awards have been given, what the funding level was, um, and so you're able to really see what the status of the NIH portfolio is right now. And I can say also that this has been developed um, not only for NIH, but other agencies in the federal government, so there's also the federal reporter, which um, you can look at pro projects at DOD, EPA, NASA, all across the federal government. Um, so we thought this might be a useful tool for this community as well, just to see what's currently being funded. So I think I've come to the end of my presentation, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Anna. I'm John Murdoch, the Chief Operating Officer of the Nashville Entrepreneur Center. We're a nonprofit public-private partnership based here in Nashville. And our mission is to help entrepreneurs create, launch, and grow businesses. And we do this work because we believe it's important. We think that entrepreneurs contribute to the communities that they work in by solving problems, creating jobs, and spreading hope. And we do this work at the Entrepreneur Center in three main ways. One, we work intensively with those growth-oriented entrepreneurs that are launching the big businesses of the future. Two, we cultivate a uniquely valuable community experience for all of the entrepreneurially minded or interested from those growth-oriented entrepreneurs to lifestyle business owners to corporate innovators and those interested in just touching or experiencing entrepreneurship. And third, we'll connect any entrepreneur of any background to the correct or best fitting resources for their needs, whether or not that resource is actually at the National Entrepreneur Center itself. And so that's one reason we're glad to be here today, supporting as a community partner our Nashville, our, the Startup Day. We see this event as evidence of some of the great foundation that's here in Nashville as we strive to become one of the best cities in the nation to launch a business. And lots of people point to different resources here that are valuable, and there are lots and many. But to name just a few, some point to the talent, those uniquely talented, skilled individuals that are a plethora here in Nashville willing to take a risk and launch a business. And many of you I see in this room have gone through our programs and launched those businesses yourselves. Others point to the knowledge and education, places like Lipscomb that cultivate new research, new ideas, and help us launch new businesses that are going to shape the future. But one that we would touch on is our uniquely valuable proposition here in Nashville as we go around the country talking to other communities is our sense of community. And as I look around this room, I see people from different backgrounds, from different businesses, all willing to come here to collaborate, to support an event, to support innovation, because we know it's building a better future for all of us. And so I'm really excited here today to be a part of this next presentation as we learn more about different ways we can apply knowledge to innovate and build a better future in healthcare and in the city and through the greater nation outside. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce our next speaker from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. The agency serves over 130 million beneficiaries and drug spending by Medicare and Medicaid accounts for nearly 40% of all pharmaceutical spending in the United States. 
Innovating on this scale has tremendous implications for us as entrepreneurs and business owners and business people and can really apply to building that new, bigger, and better future and success that we've heard talked about multiple times today. So I'm very looking forward to introducing Sherard, Sherard McKee. Sherard has contributed to CMS on many levels and worked with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation in its earliest days as that initiative developed new payment models. So please welcome or join me in welcoming Sherrod McKee. Good morning. Uh, thank you guys for having me. Um, again, my name is Sherrod Mackey. I'm actually filling in for Dr. Bernard Murray. He's the uh, consortium administrator based out of Atlanta. And he sends his uh, deepest uh, regrets for not being able to attend in person. Um, he had an emergency come up on Monday, so I found out on yesterday that I would be filling in for him. <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit about me. I am a licensed attorney. I'm a master lo level social worker and proud graduate of Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, from Aiken, South Carolina. And I've been working with Dr. Murray for a little over a year now came from uh, CMMI, the Innovation Center, and most recently I was embedded in the Office of the Associate Director for Policy at the CDC. Um, I spent 18 months there uh, before coming over and working with Dr. Murray. And at CMMI, I, I was actually a lead project officer in the patient care models group. I think I broke the button. Okay, cool. All right, so just want to give a quick overview of CMS. Um, we are an operating division within HHS, and our programs focus on providing quality health at a reasonable cost. Uh, we serve the most vulnerable populations, uh, elderly, persons with disabilities, children, and low-income citizens. Our headquarters is in Baltimore, Maryland, and we have over 6,400 staff members. A bulk of our work is done through third-party contractors, though. Uh, we regulate about 7,300 hospitals, 1.5 million physicians, 40 million claims a day. Um, actually, our program, the Medicare program alone, pays out about $1.5 billion uh, in benefits per day. Um, and so I want to take this chance to, to share some initiatives that we're focusing on at CMS. Um, again, someone spoke earlier and said, and it's true, that CMS is one of the largest health care purchasers in the United States. Um, and we oversee about 143 million Americans in terms of Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, and the health insurance exchanges. Um, at CMS, we monitor quality of care, provide the states with matching funds for Medicaid benefits, and develop policies and procedures for the assurance of safety and quality for medical facilities. We continue to strive for better care, smarter spending, and healthier people. Um, here is a org chart of our leadership. Uh, we're proudly led by Administrator Seema Verma and her senior leadership team consisting of uh, Kimberly Brandt, who's the Principal Deputy Administrator for Operations, uh, Demetrius Kozaskis, who's the Principal Deputy Administrator for Medicare, uh, Brady Brooks, who's the Deputy Chief of Staff, and Karen Jackson, who's the Deputy Chief Operating Officer. Uh, we have 10 field offices across the country and they all work in alignment with central office. Uh, Tennessee is a part of Region 4, which is based out of Atlanta. Um, the 10 regional offices are organized by a consortium based on key lines of business. And that intent is for the structure to improve performance and uh, have uniform management and communication. Uh, the consortium structure is touched on every 10 regions. We have a Medicaid uh, health plans operation. We have a Medicare fee-for-service and financial management consortium. We have uh, the Medicaid and CHIP, and then we have the consortium for quality improvement and survey cer certification operations, which we call Cisco, which a lot of people mistake for Crisco, but. <laughs> okay. 
So each consortium is led by a consortium administrator who's a senior management official. And those consortium administrators, their book of work covers the entire uh, United States, but they also manage region, two or three regional offices. Uh, my manager, Dr. Murray, he manages Region 4, which is based out of Atlanta. And he also managed Region 6, which is based out of Dallas, Texas. Uh, this is an org chart from Cisco, and it shows that um, basically we have uh, uh, regional administrators in every 10 uh, regional office that does the work for quality improvement, survey, and certification. And so Cisco consists of four distinct uh, books of work. Uh, we consist of the Division of Quality Improvement, so we provide oversight for all the QIO programs in the end-stage renal disease network. We also consist of the Division for Survey and Certification, which provides uh, oversight of all the state survey agencies, and they ensure uh, all of our uh, providers uh, adhere to the conditions of participation. Uh, we also manage each regional uh, chief medical officer in each of the 10 regions. Um, those are the, the, the folk who provide outreach in, in the different regions. Um, actually, Dr. Rick Wild is the CMO for Region uh, 4, if you haven't met him before. And then we also uh, manage the emergency preparedness and response for the agency. So, you know, it's been a uh, very busy 2017. As you all know, we had three Category 4 hurricanes that touched down within 30 days of each other. So that's been quite an effort within CMS. Okay, so working with CMS, uh, myself and Dr. Murray will be happy to connect you guys with anyone within our organization that may be a help to you. A few keys that we do want to stress is, you know, contact us as early as possible in the process. If you're going to work on a study design, you should engage someone at CMS prior to it being finalized. Um, please take advantage of our website, uh, cms.gov, as there are many resources there. Um, you can find on our website an innovator's guide to navigate Medicare and it's under the Council for Technology and Innovation webpage. Um, please keep in mind, with, with your idea, have a benefit category, and a good place to start looking is Section 1861 of the Social Security Act. Uh, you should also research what we are cu currently covering and what we're currently not covering. And your solution should be reasonable and, and necessary in diagnosing and treating the illness, which is separate from FDA's safe and effective. When we look for reasonable and necessary, we're looking for a significant improvement of net positive health outcomes and it is important to the patient. This qu the question remains, is it mean meaningful to the patient? And does it improve the activities of daily living? Okay, our beneficiaries' three most important issues are independence, quality of life, and functional status. We're looking for better ways to deliver care, pay providers for a healthy community, a healthy economy, and a healthier country. As I said earlier, we led by Administrator Seema Verma, and she's established four strategic goals, empowering patients and doctors to make decisions about their health care, ushering in a new era of state flexibility and local leadership, support innovative approaches, and improve the CMS customer experience. Uh, along with the White House Office of Innovation, we launched the My Health eData initiative to give patients more control of their health records. The key uh, strategies here is the patient should be in charge. The data belongs to the patient and they should have control of it. This initiative puts more decision-making power in the patient hands and ensuring access to health inf information to help reduce fraud and abuse. Uh, Ed mentioned earlier the uh, Blue Button 2.0 initiative as it's a major step towards patient control and health information. Another focus of SEMA, um, Administrator SEMA Verma is the regulatory reform and provider burden. Uh, we've established an initiative titled Patients Over Paperwork, and this is something the entire agency is working on. We found that some regulations are necessary to ensure patient safety. Uh, and, but we are also finding that some are not as effective. 
So the top priority for patients over paperwork is reducing unnecessary burden, increasing efficiencies, and improving their customer experience. We're working with the private sector uh, toward patient-centered care and market-driven reform. We're currently uh, conducting a national listening tour across the country for providers to tell us what regulations were causing the most burden. Another initiative Administrator Verm has placed a great focus on is addressing the opioid crisis. Uh, CMS is revising and updating its opioid response with initial steps of engaging stakeholders in listening sessions and incorporating opioid-related measures in Medicare's QPP program. So in a room full of innovators, um, I think it's very important to highlight our innovation center, CMMI. Um, we are constantly developing new payment models. Uh, last year, we actually put out a request for information and heard great ideas across the country. And this year, we're actually building on some of those great ideas and putting them into models. Uh, three scenarios for success from statute is quality improves, cost neutral, quality neutral, cost reduce, and quality improves, cost neutral in the best case. If a model meets one of these three criteria and other statutory prerequisites, the statute allows the secretary to expand the duration and scope of a model through real rulemaking, and that's very unique to the CMS Innovation Center. So the Innovation Center was created by Congress for the purpose of testing innovative payment and service delivery models to reduce program expenditures uh, while preserving and enhancing the quality of care. The Innovation Center includes testing new payment models, service delivery models, evaluating results, and advancing best practices. We also engage in a broad range of stakeholders to develop additional models for testing. Now, CMS is aligning with the private sector and states to deliver system uh, reform, and our Innovation Center models currently impact over 18 billion beneficiaries in each state. We have over 200,000 healthcare providers and provider groups participating in CMMI programs currently. Uh, we're invested in innovation across the country and we will continue to partner with this important work. We value your input and will continue to benefit from your expertise and experience. I again uh, implore you to please uh, utilize our website at cms.gov. So all of the models that have been stood up, all of the models that are current, uh, you'll find all the evaluation reports there, which is a, 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 can be a great value to anyone. Um, you know, for instance, we had two uh, healthcare innovation awards throughout the country. Round one was 107 awardees. Um, it was a, a billion dollar program, 107 awardees. Round two had 43 awardees across the country. It covered uh, a broad spectrum of, of health uh, related items. and. All of those evaluation reports are on our CMS website right now, and it's just a, it, it's, it's a valuable information there. Um, I, I also implore you to reach out to the program and policy team uh, within the Innovation Center. So one last initiative I would like to speak on, um, and you know, I know in this room full of forward-thinking innovators, you know, in 2018, I, I must tell you that the Medicare cards still contain social security numbers on them. So we are working to fix that now. Uh, the MACRA Act was, uh, it, it required CMS to basically remove social security numbers from all Medicare cards by April 2019. And this new Medicare card will contain a unique Medicare number instead of a social security number, and it's a change to prevent uh, identity theft. We actually started mailing out these cards in April, and, but we are also starting to see scams and fraud schemes to take advantage of our beneficiaries. So the new Medicare card will contain only uh, a beneficiary's name, the Medicare number, and the dates that Medicare Part A and Part B coverage started. It will not contain a signature, it will not contain a social security number, and it will not contain gender. Uh, the new cards will be mailed out in phases by geographic location, and beneficiaries can start using the card immediately. Uh, we will have a transition period from the old, new, old to the new card beginning April 1st, 2018, up until December 31st, 2019. Beginning January 1st, 2020, 
Only the new Medicare card and a new number will be usable. Um, we are recommending that you know you guys reach out to who, whatever beneficiary you may know, and and once they get that new card, please destroy that old one. Please don't share that new Medicare number with anyone who contacts them by phone, email, or even approach them in person um, unless they've given prior permission. And we've actually launched a web page uh, where people can go and sign up for emails about the new card and check the status of their state, and that's medicare.gov backslash new card. So clearly, I'm not Renard Murray. <laughs> he's a little thinner, and uh, <laughs> but um, you know he's uh, and myself. You know we want to be a resource to you all. We ask that you please share your thoughts with us at CMS. Um, we appreciate your much needed input as the leaders who are on the front line of healthcare. Uh, Dr. Murray can be reached at Renard.Murray at CMS.HHS.gov. His number is area code 404-562-7150. And I can be reached at Sherard Mackey, S-H-E-R-A-R-D dot M-C-K-I-E at CMS.HHS.gov. And I can be reached at 404-562-7902. Um, we, like I said, we support everything you guys are doing here. And if it's anything or anyone uh, we can connect you with, we would be more than happy to. And it is an absolute pleasure to be here, and I wish you all a very productive day. Thank you, Sherard, and also to Anna and Ed for being here. We appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to, to be with us here in Nashville. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tommy Lewis. I'm on the, a member of the senior leadership team at Change Healthcare. I'm also uh, the president of Tennessee Hymns, one of the community partners for today's event. I'd like to thank all of you for attending today and continuing to support the healthcare ecosystem here in Middle Tennessee. Events like today's will help us on our, on our large goal of becoming a major healthcare IT hub in the United States. Tennessee Hymns is one of the largest and most active HIMSS chapters in the United States with over 2,000 members. We're one of the most active chapters in terms of programming. Our core mission revolves around professional development, around workforce development, and advocacy on behalf of our members in the field of healthcare information and technology. Some of our signature programs include our HIT Workforce Accelerator that we partner with Belmont University to deliver. This is a 14-week certification program that has graduated 130 individuals that have gone on to find employment in healthcare IT or receive promotions at their existing firms. This program is led by Todd Featherling, who is one of the mentors in this afternoon's session. In August, Tennessee Hymns will partner with the Health Further Festival, where we will deliver the 10th Annual Summit of the Southeast. We're the official HIT programming partner for the festival. We'd love to see you there. And finally, uh, many of you back in April attended our session, Innovators and Incumbents Better Together, held at AmSurge, which was planned and led by Eric Threlkill, who's our incoming chapter president. If you're not already a member of Tennessee Hymns, we'd love to see you get involved. Events like today's Startup Nashville would not be possible without great sponsors. I'd once again like to recognize our supporting sponsor is HCA, TriStar Health. Associate sponsors are AmSurge, Sherard, Rowe, Voigt, and Harbison. And finally, Launch Tennessee in recognition of their contributions to the Small Business Innovation Research Matching Program. Let's have another round of applause for our sponsors. <laughs> And lastly, the council networking and luncheon will be held at the Renaissance Hotel across the street. Just look for the tall hotel. And then we'll come back here after lunch for the startup day pitch sessions. So thanks, everyone. Enjoy lunch. All right, good afternoon. Um, I hope you guys are having a great time. I'm tall, and that's even tall. Uh, if, for those of you that don't know or weren't in the last session, my name's Hugh Hale. I'm the CIO for the state of Tennessee, TenCare. Uh, but today I'm going to play uh, uh, moderator for uh, probably to me the most exciting session and the thing that's just really, uh, really uh, sets this day off. Uh, it, 
Nashville is such a hotbed for uh, for healthcare and and for healthcare technology and st and startups that uh, it was hard when we were trying to come up with a representation, a group uh, to 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 present to all of you uh, about you know all the innovation that's going on here. But I think we came up with a great uh, representative group, and uh, and and I'm I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to to. Uh, be able to meet and engage with entrepreneurs from from the state and from uh, from other places, and I think you're going to really love what you what you see here. We have a lot of the uh, companies I talked about that will be presenting today, and uh, this is how it's going to work. So each company is going to come up, kind of a not not a not really Shark Tank style, but they're going to have 10 minutes to present their uh, their concept. And our panel of mentors here will. Uh, We'll, ask, we'll have a few minutes to ask questions and provide uh, provide feedback. I'll introduce you to them in just a second. Uh, we also have Ed Simcox here, the deputy uh, CTO of HHS, all of three days on the job, which is uh, exciting. And um, we have uh, Anna uh, Mazuko. Uh, she is the special assistant deputy director of NIH. Man, I put that on a business card. It's really long. Um, they're here in the front row, and they're going to serve as reviewers and provide uh, feedback. And uh, I'll introduce you to the mentor panel now. It's, uh, we have Todd Featherling, the CEO of Perception Health. Uh, we have Paul Curry, the CTO of HCA, ITNS. And we have Connie McGee from Microsoft. So uh, welcome. I'm glad to have you guys here. And again, thank you all for being here and supporting this day and supporting the entrepreneurs in, uh, in Nashville. With that, I want to introduce you to the first company because this is what you really came to see. And so uh, Amanda Waller from Manny Bear, come on up. And uh, the stage is all yours. One second. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be here and talk about our company. Um, Manny Bear Technologies is a behavioral health tech company that builds tools and games to help therapists connect with their young patients. We provide them and empower them the ability to get past hurdles of informational gaps and trust-related problems, ultimately resulting and more meaningful conversations and quicker patient outcomes. I need a clicker. It's okay. We're all kind of disabled. Let's see. Where's the back? Where's the back? No, this one. This one. Oh. All right. We're going to get this together without going deaf in the process. So research research suggests that one out of every five children, ages three to 17, has a diagnosable mental, emotional, or behavioral health disorder. Of those children, up to 70% are actually able to, to go into therapy. Sorry, 70% actually end up leaving therapy and dropping out at early rate. I and my children are a part of that statistic, sadly. My story of how Manny Bear came about was very personal. In 2005, I went through a horrendous divorce, um, carrying my three young children through it with me. As divorce and change is hard enough on all children that we know, I had one of my youngest children come to me and tell me that she was being sexually abused during that time at daycare. Immediately, I jumped into action. Uh, not only did we go the legal route, but we knew that in order to get in front of this, that we had to go the therapeutic route as well. So immediately, I put them in therapy, find, find, you know, searching on Google, who can I have? We get them in, and I'm thinking, yes, this is it. I'm gonna solve all the problems, and they're gonna come out completely healthy, and it's only gonna take like a week or two, right? That is not the case. We go in, and an hour passes by, and they say, they come out, and I'm like, all right, what's the problem? 
how can I help? Like, what can I do? They're like, they didn't want to talk. What do you mean they didn't want to talk? Like, have you met my children? That's all they do is talk. No, they didn't want to talk. So we go back, and I'm like, okay, no big deal. You know, we'll, we'll chalk it up to nervousness. This is a stranger, right? Second week comes in. Going in again, I'm like, all right, I'm going to solve the world's problems. Here comes world peace, mom of the year. Here we go. No, they didn't want to talk again. So at this point, I was starting to get concerned. I started to observe my children to figure out, well, why? Why are they not connecting? And it was right here where I first started to realize the hardship that children go through with trying to connect with a therapist and the long, drawn-out process that that includes. So we're going back, and we're in round three, week three at this point, and I'm going, okay, we're in week three. Something's got to give, right? No. Come to find out, on average, it takes anywhere, ah, I'm not working, there it is, oh, I think we went too far. Ah, I'm missing a slide somewhere. Okay, on average it takes anywhere between two to six weeks for a child to actually build trust with their therapist. So for me, I said, there has to be a better way. There has to be a better way to do this. So I started to sit and observe my children in their natural environments, whether it be in the car or at home. And I noticed that my children were right here in this digital world. And it occurred to me that we had to meet them where they are. Research also suggests that 56% of children ages 8 to 12 have their own cell phone. This is not to be confused with that they pay for their own cell phone, because they don't. Up to 70% of households with children own at least one tablet. The technology out there, the access that these children have, there is no reason why we can't meet them where they are. And this is where Manny Bear Technologies was born. all kinds of technical problems. Yeah, it's out of process, but that's okay. Um, so I go back and I start talking to the therapist. And I say, help me understand what you do. I've been in IT healthcare for about 10 years now. I've implemented multiple EHRs, so I understand clinician workflow and how impaired it is to understand how these clinicians work. You don't want to impact, negatively impact what they're doing. So I say, can you explain this to me? Can you tell me why this is taking so long? And they said, yeah, no problem. They said it does take anywhere between two to six weeks to build the trust, and that it can be frustrating and rather costly. And that's due to because a portion, up to 50% of their time, is spent in observation mode. Our money is going towards observation and play therapy. And there's nothing wrong with that, per se, unless you are a parent that is desperately searching for hope. And six weeks feels like a lifetime. So as, as we're going through and she's explaining this process to me, 50% of the time is just watching these children play. And about 15 minutes is actually used to talk and to connect with them which explains the longevity of the process. 10, 15 minutes is spent with administrative time. This is where I had the epiphany that something had to change. I ended up connecting with my co-founder and I said, let's build something different. Let's innovate this. Let's build storybooks alongside of therapists that have relevant clinical data that shows us and creates meaningful contextual conversations with these children. With that, as we have designed the MVP out, we have now gotten to our MVP stage. We've gone through the process of working with these therapists, building this out, and have gotten to the point where we feel that our future workflow is in the pre-assessment or the pre-enter stage of therapy, 
We don't want to hinder your workflow. We want to help your workflow. And with that, you play the game. The child plays the game. They're waiting. And we have designed it in a way for the data to come into the back part of our clinical system. The game, the first game that we have built for is grievancy and loss. The, the context of this game is that you are a knight returning from a mission and you come across this little girl that is outside crying outside the cabin. And you have a choice as the knight to help the young, men, help the young lady or go on your way. This tells something about how, where the child is. Are they ready to talk about their problems? Where are they contextually? And it gives also contextual data to the clinician that helps them create talking points. These games are truly designed to get into the world of the child's inner psyche, to understand how they're feeling and where, whether or not they're ready to actually talk about their problems. How we have designed this game, we can take the data, the pre, the mid, and the post data of the assessments and figure out where in the therapy process is working, where they are in the beginning to say this is where you are in the grievancy process and help create those meaningful conversations. The data is collected and it is, I, I'm seeing you, <laughs> it is live to the clinical portal that we have built out. I'm, I'm being told to hurry, so I apologize. <laughs> the data is available, the clinician sees it prior to the visit, this starts the conversations between the therapist and the child. To talk about, to figure out, are we on the right path, we did a small focus group. We had a group of about eight children, ages seven to 10, that we pulled into a room, had them play the game, and every single child went to the heart of the matter immediately with therapists that they have never met before. 100% of those children asked to be a part of beta and asked to come back for the next episode, which patient retention for that purpose alone is huge. They want to come back because they want to get to the next game. A couple of our next steps that we're actually working on for our next episode is a game that will allow us to take away the taboo that therapy seems to have in society. So it will help set expectations for parents as well as those patients coming in. Um, we are currently also working on the white paper research that's also in progress to help um, solidify what we're doing, as well as running a beta mid-July with a local healthcare company with about 50 to 100 patients. Okay, good, <laughs> sorry. So thank you so much. I apologize for all the technical difficulties. <laughs> Thanks to you. Some questions? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, sure, I can, I can start. Um, sure. uh, great emotional hook. I wish you would have led with that because uh, you'd have had me all in and I okay. wouldn't have cared what else you had to say the, okay. rest, of the <laughs> rest of the time. Um, the, the problem statement that you said is also a good one. Uh, Spent a lot of time with behavioral health in Southern California right now. So um, I, I would have liked it if you had the hook the problem statement, your solution, okay. uh, and I never heard the ask. Okay. So you have a room full of investors, entrepreneurs, yeah. government leaders. Okay. Um, mental health is on everybody's radar. Yeah. yeah. So always have a big ask. Okay. Thank you, sir. No, um, Connie McGee. So you know what I would like to just interject is I love your story. Thank you lead with that story okay. in my opinion i mean that is something everybody now if you think about it it's all about the storytelling yeah. to really start off with when i look at what you're doing and the impact you could have with this especially on the children and your target audience um, it also brings into question is what is your target audience mm -hmm. there's there's children everywhere so yeah. you know really think about you can't really go out and boil the ocean Correct. with this so where you're going to really focus and target is it going to be in the schools and the education system mm -hmm. is it going to be in the uh, health care provider system or is it going to be really more on those integrated health uh, entities but no I, I think to Todd's comments I think you've got a powerful story and it's just getting it a little bit tighter and, and really knowing your audience yes thank you so much oh our target audience is actually children ages 7 to 11 
we're starting out from entering into getting past that clinician adoption with private therapies. And then we will actually scale into the schools. Um, one of the big needs that we have actually identified is foster care systems. That's kind of what's considered the low hanging fruit um, because they have the largest need, as well as um, counseling centers, schools, the ratio between teach, uh, gu guidance counselor to students is enormous. So the potential impact on how we're trying to come into the market goes beyond. And then um, eventually the ultimate idea is to marry the legal system and the healthcare system together for children that are going through divorces. So I'll take a little bit different approach. Okay. Um, so first of all, obviously, fantastic story, great, great way of, of marrying in the experience into the product side. Thank you. Really trying to t establish an emotional connection. For me, the questions that first go to play are security. Yes. Uh, this is a, an, a, an area that, especially in children that age these days, yes. with every, every toy having something on it, yes. how, how, what are you doing to protect, to protect the children, to protect the parents of the children? Sure, so um, I can answer this a couple different ways. We'll talk about the back end first. So we are hosted by Clear Data, which is a HIPAA and high trust secured platform. Um, we have, a part of being a part of Clear Data is they do a risk assessment with us to make sure that we are completely compliant and secured. Um, I mentioned my background, uh, which is IT healthcare. So I have a lot of familiarity Currently, I am with a company that is doing a lot of cybersecurity initiatives. So I, uh, we, that is on our highest top priority, making sure that we secure that, making sure that um, each child gets a unique identifier code, uh, making sure that we understand how it's logged in and secured, and you know through the what um, the secured sign-ons and, and so on and so forth, as well as the devices don't leave the therapeutic office. Originally, and this was a great piece of feedback as we were running our play therapy test, was what works for you as a therapist, right? And they said, well, if these children take this home and play this game and then suddenly something happens, we can't get to them. So a great security measure that made sense to us is like, we'll do it in the beginning because they're in the office, it's controlled, it's their device, and it's parent, parental sign-off, so it is secured, and so we, it's, we've thought through the process of making sure that the data is very, very secured. Amanda, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Mentor, for your Thank pleasure. you guys so much. Yeah. And, yeah, any feedback or no? Sure. Um, Thank you very much. It was, it's, uh, it's a great uh, business idea, and it sounds like you put a ton of thought into it. Um, I just wanted to go back and ask, um, how do you um, envision, what, what is your go-to-market strategy? Who do you see envision, who do you envision paying, yeah. right? Because that's a big deal, right? A lot of times we, we have surrogates, if you will, paying for yeah. whatever's happening, you know, for the clinician or for the patient. So, um, and then, you know, how do you plan on tack, you know, kind of tackling the market? What's your total addressable market? Sure. So uh, that's quite a conjunction question, so I'm going to kind of have it to is, break sorry. it down. So I apologize. So one of my favorite questions I get asked is, who is my customer, right? And it always depends on who I'm talking to. From the investor standpoint, they will always come and say, I think it's your parents. Because when you are so desperate and in the need of hope that they'll pay whatever. But when I start to talk, and my personal belief is is actually the therapist. Because if you don't have clinician buy-in, you have you're a dead duck in the water. So our true um, purchaser, buyer, is our therapist. Yeah. Um, our come to market. Oh, <laughs> um, our come to market is to um, just slowly integrate in. We want to build a product that works, that's useful. So it's a slow approach. It is little step by step to go to these therapists, make those connections, and let them experience us. Let them let us meet meet them and help integrate, and then get that word of mouth out. Great, thanks. Thank great. you. Thank you, Amanda. That was thanks. great. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, guys. All right, and now I'll introduce uh, Guy Bernard from uh, uh, Synchronous Health. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Guy Barnard, uh, co-founder and CEO of Synchronous Health. We are also a behavioral health startup. Um, we actually serve the 17 to retirement uh, market and uh, bring artificial intelligence to it. 
Um, just a little bit about background about me. I actually left after 30 years in uh, strategy consulting and population health. If you want to start bringing up the slides, please. Um, left after 30 years, uh, I was CIO of a $2 billion public company serving maybe 65 million people um, around the world. But, but I really felt as an industry, we weren't doing enough to serve the type of problems that Amanda was describing um, so much from the heart. Uh, and I felt innovation could help, and sometimes you have to start small um, to, uh, to, to solve big problems. We are actually still in a garage. We're, we're celebrating our two-year anniversary today, actually. Um, and, uh, and I'd like to share a little bit of that story with you. Because when I hear stories like Amanda's, um, I think we are facing the biggest health crisis of our time. Uh, you know, how many of us can also share a story by either ourselves or someone we know who's experiencing uh, anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, substance use. I know I have with someone close to me. And I'd like to introduce you today to someone called Carla who thinks she can solve it. Or at least she's programmed to think she can. Happy birthday, Carla. You know, we know, uh, you know one in five uh, suddenly children will experience this, but, but it's closer to one in two in a lifetime will experience a behavioral health condition. Um, and when you look at, sorry about the slides here, uh, when you look at the cost of that, you know, someone living with a condition has four times the higher physical health costs than those without. That's a $500 billion problem overall. But why is it that 45% of those who died by suicide actually saw their PCP within the last month of their death. To me, this says clearly humans and prescriptions alone are not the solution. So we actually assembled a team of experts, technologists, behavioral health practitioners, lifestyle medicine luminaries, partners with Global Reach to try and figure this out. And here's what we found. We really don't need just another app. There's 45,000 of these in the app store alone just for mental health alone. And I think technology in the broader sense might be part of the problem. Anyone here have teens? No, what, what we found was that the number one predictor of outcome is human empathy. So we've been assembling a team of experts, uh, counselors, coaches, who are screened with the gift of empathy. Uh, they operate over telehealth. That gives us an immediate revenue model. And it allows us to scale with technology. But when I talk about technology, I'm not talking about big data. I'm not talking about algorithms. I'm not talking about blockchain. As the CIO, I, you know, I say table stakes to all that. What I'm talking about is microdata. So if I say to my Apple Watch right now, hey, Carla, I'm feeling anxious, because actually I'm in front of this crowd and with this uh, clicker here. Um, what Carla does is she records the intent of what I just said. She normalizes it. She records the GPS location of where we are at Spark in Nashville. She records people in my circle who are nearby. So a lot of data, the weather outside, she has access to. But more than data, it's the context of my life, how many steps I took today, the fact that I'm at a conference when I'm normally at the office, the fact that conferences can be stressful for me. So this allows us to truly understand human behavior. With human behavior, we can, we can start to provide uh, support in the moment. So Carla might suggest a walking meditation for me. She might suggest uh, an audio. Uh, she might allow me to journal for my specialist, because our specialists also program Carla. So it, this becomes a closed loop feedback, humans labeling the data and Carla learning. So what our solution essentially is, is humans plus artificial intelligence. Any place, anywhere, anytime. Our business model and our target sort of customers are universities, health plans, employers, and provider systems. I'm here in front of this group today because we like to add gov government, state, and, and federal to that list. Our contracts are moving from four or five sort of close pilots to marquee customers. And again, just bear with me with the slides. Uh, we'll be looking to clear just a little under a million dollars in revenue this year. Our contracts are ranging from 200,000 to about a million. But the reason why customers are contracting with us is um, to reduce costs, to improve health, to improve performance, to improve quality of life and functional status, as, as we learned this morning. 
but to also provide outcomes as we go. Questions on security, I think, are incredibly important here. So we actually promote privacy by design as a key core element of our value proposition. But I'd like to, um, I just need to get a little bit closer to this. Um, what I'd like to do is just give you a very quick case example to try and bring this to life. So we're um, launching on July 1st a program with veterans. Uh, just for context here, context here, there are 7 million uh, within the United States um, that are served by this system, a little under $77 billion of care, a uh, very high mental health burden within this population. And what we're essentially serving are those living with post-traumatic stress disorder. It's humans plus technology, as I described. We'll be looking to reduce the treatment from 12 weeks to eight weeks. It's about $50 per targeted member per month for us. We're delivering cognitive processing therapy in partnership. We go to market, we distribute here with a partner uh, who, who, who's well serving this. But if you think about the value proposition for this, so about $100, when you think about the value proposition here, um, what, what, you, what you might think is, can we just get 10% of the savings? If we, if we do that, that's an 11 to 1 ROI just on this digital program alone. So we think this is a, an enormous problem and something that you know, programs like Carla can help. So what I'd like to do is sort of turn it over for questions. But before I actually do that, I think that's my Apple watch vibrating. And I'm not sure if you can hear it, but she's saying, so she just said, hey, guy, I think you had nothing to worry about. Um, so with that, let, let me open it up for questions. Um. Interesting presentation is the, a uh, couple questions first. Uh, is the watch required for the program interaction? Um, it's not. So we're looking to be wherever the consumer, the participant, the, pa the patient is. So we'll work on Amazon Alexa. We'll work on Google Home if we want to have a voice interface. If we're working with a population that just isn't using that type of technology, this can just be plain, um, short, simple message service, plain old SMS. And then um, what's your price point per member per user, is that the $100 per month? So we have a range, in that particular veterans population it's actually $50, we have it going up to 100 in some populations, really it depends on the mix, the, the sort of the level of risk and condition within so the population. So cost or per month? Uh, that's for a digital program fee, what we also designed this to do though was to work within the existing healthcare system, so because we have that human network, we can actually just drop a claim for our counselors and coaches. Um, and so with that, that more than covers the cost of the program. We get about a two to one efficiency with our counselors relative to an existing program. So we don't charge any more in a sense per hour for an hour of counseling and then we're able to deliver these services. So I'm, I'm very interested in AI for numerous reasons only because I work with Microsoft and that is huge for us as far as the investment forward, what we're looking to do and especially impacting healthcare. What, what we look at right now is we have uh, bots that we're using a lot in healthcare and putting those out there on the forefront. And when you think about the shortage that we're experiencing in the clinicians and the physicians, and it's going to get worse before it ever gets better, how do you see this entry point into the market and where do you see that entry point? I mean, you look at this could be applied throughout the entire continuum. But are you looking at the family as the entry point for a child or how are you looking to integrate this a little bit to where, because we all know it's not just about that individual that is a high risk patient, but it's about the environment in which they reside. Yeah, um, so what we find with this solution is it probably works best with those who are living with some risk of, of a behavioral health condition or living with a condition. It's probably, it can supplement maybe an inpatient type capability, but it, it won't replace that. And for those who are thriving, if there are any of us, you know, this, this may not be you know, the, the right support. Within that, so that's still a very broad, you know, probably 80, 90% of the population. What we do is we really just go after the, the sort of the customer's needs. So when we're serving a university, we're serving the freshman class and we're thinking about things like binge drinking, we're thinking about things like anxiety and stress on campus, we're thinking about suicide being the number two cause of death on campus. When we're dealing with veterans, we're going to be thinking about things like PTSD and how we can use you know, techniques like cognitive processing therapy to do that. So it, it definitely goes by market. 
we're limiting ourselves to sort of four or five markets initially to essentially test this within each of those, picking you know, what we think is a marquee customer within each, and then that'll allow us in about a year to publish more outcomes around each of those, and then pursue you know, perhaps more in depth, perhaps, perhaps less in others. Well, would there be some alerts or triggers that would say, hey, this is a high-risk patient that needs to get additional attention that would go to a physician or one of the providers? Yeah, one of the things we're doing is actually screening the language all the time, and it could be someone interacting with Carla, could also actually be interacting on social media. But if we see particular keywords, and so if you think about suicide being a you know, particularly um, you know, common topic, all too common topic right now, when we say, see essentially do analysis, language analysis, using just algorithms that are out there, um, including you know, from Azure and other places, uh, what, what we'll do is essentially escalate to a human. Um, so that's where we want to make sure this is under the right supervision. If Carla can handle it, she will. If it, if it reaches a point where perhaps it's best to have an expert involved, then we will. Okay. Thank you. So and I guess to kind of follow on on some of that, as you think about uh, the elevation of notifications and so forth, is that something that you provide? Or is that something that's typically done within maybe a health service? I noticed that you do that you're looking at employers, and I'm not sure that they have direct access to some of those resources. How do you, how do you envision that coming about? Um, yeah, so our platform is, is essentially, it, you know, our data center is living on the, on the individual's device. Um, and so we are able to sort of surface quite a lot of capability right there. This could be messages from Carla. This could be, you know, interactions. You didn't quite see it here because of the, the technology. Um, but, but certainly you can, you can sort of imagine the type of interface you would have. Um, at the same time, we want to essentially integrate with all the resources that are out there. When we enter a university, as example, there's usually 50 programs that are already on campus dealing with all these types of things, but there's nothing that kind of integrates it all together. And so all Carla is really doing in that case is acting like a digital care coordinator <coughs> and essentially steering the individual to the right resource, but right in the moment that they need it. And then one last comment, if I might. Um, you know, you talk about privacy and it, and it being a very, very key thing to everything that you're yeah. doing. But then you mentioned Alexa and Google Home. Yeah. And so <laughs> I would kind of, from my seat, I would yeah. argue the two are kind of counter opposed right now. Um, <laughs> there's still a lot of work to be done there. So I just think that's something you just need to kind of keep in mind. A lot of concern over what happens to that data and what Amazon and Google and, yeah. and Microsoft is doing with some of that voice. Yeah, so. no, we, we, we share your concerns. Okay. Yeah. Thank sure. you. Um, great job. What um, can you can you talk about the relationship with your partner? Are they your go-to-market partner? Are they are are you are they your distribution channel? I, I wasn't quite understanding that. Yeah, no. Um, so we actually we're we're trying to build several distribution partnerships. So so in in most of our cases we're actually going. Um, excuse me, now. that's collar again. Um, thing, time's up. Um, she she thinks you're getting nervous. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's oh, right. that's um, no, we, uh, we, I mean, most of our markets were actually going direct, um, just through our relationships. We've got um, on our board three of the CEOs, sort of the largest population health businesses um, that, that have been there. In the veterans um, area particularly, and you know, one of the reasons why we're here today is really trying to understand how to work with, with um, state, local, and federal government. Um, in that, we picked a partner who's been in that market for 12 years, and so we, we, we can do that. Um, there. As we look in other markets, we'll pick other partners. There was another one there who's actually in the technology space, and we'll take us into some of the EAP providers, for example, mm -hmm. in subbing. So $1 million uh, second year? Um, it, well, as we close, yeah. I mean, we just hit our second birthday yeah. today, so as we finish this well done. year. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Great. Very, Thank very you. exciting. Yeah. All right. With that, I'll introduce uh, Lon Heck from Utilize Health. Lon? Thank you. I think we have a working Yeah, case. I just have to have this turned on. Okay, I could try. Oh, there we go. That worked out great. <laughs> so I'm taking human error out, and Becky is going to stand in the back and help me change the slides. Thank you. Here, would you like this, Becky? Can you tell me Yeah, I'll let you know, definitely. So thank you very much for having us in here today. Um, I am actually taking the place of our CEO, Jessica Harthcock. Um, I will do no justice to her story, but I'll do the best that I possibly can. So my name is Lon Hecht, Chief Commercial Officer for Utilize Health, and we focus on a targeted neurological care management uh, solution. So our CEO, Jessica, who I wish could be here today but had a bit of an accident, um, she was paralyzed 14 years ago. Gymnastics accident, broke her neck, 
was given a 0% chance of ever walking again. And those of you, and I know a lot of you know her, um, know that that is just not an answer that you give to Jessica. And Jessica went and traveled the country with her family for six years and did treatment in 60 plus hospitals and facilities, and after six years was able to walk unassisted. Okay, now that's great news, terrific. But a lot of people, they can't stick with it that long, and they don't know where to go. It's, it's definitely an area um, that is very gray on how to get there. And that's part of what uh, prompted this program from Jessica. So if you look at a patient like Jessica, she should be costing, even after 14 years, she should still cost about $150,000 a year um, to a payer. She cost less than $2,000 last year. The reason is, if you can maximize that recovery, that's a fantastic thing, you're also gonna take those costs down. Now I just wanna say, of course, there are gonna be um, little things that pop up here and there over, overall, but directionally, it's gonna lower those costs very greatly. So, Becky, can you uh, turn the slide? So I mentioned we have a targeted neurological care management program. Our goals are very simple. It's to improve outcomes, reduce costs, and improve member satisfaction. And, and I'll just say very quickly that we are selling to risk-bearing entities, so that would be your health plans, it would be your Medicaid, Medicare plans, could be ACOs, it could be independent practice associations, things like that. So this market opportunity is enormous. $240 billion annually is spent in these six categories, including stroke, brain injury, spinal cord injury, uh, multiple sclerosis, muscular dystrophy, and cerebral palsy. It impacts about 11 million members in the US. So that's just a market sizing just for those areas. Can you switch it forward? Thanks, Becky. Um, but I wanna talk about from a payer perspective, when you look at the data and they look in, internally, they find that about three to 5% of their members actually fall into that area. But surprisingly, and this floors them, it's actually about 12 to 24% of overall costs. They tend to think before this starts that they're talking about maybe 5% of their costs, but things are misclassified. It's hard to find these people in the data. And when they see it, it really is an eye-opening uh, thing for them. So to give you a difference between somebody like you and I, sorry about that, and uh, someone like Jessica, we have a 5% chance in a given year of getting admitted to the hospital for an average of like two to three days length of stay. Somebody like Jessica is a 55% chance every year at about, uh, what is it, 24 days on that length of stay. So they're very costly patients and managing them is, is very important. Okay. So this is a slide of Jessica just during you know, her recovery. I, I think the big thing that I want to mention is, um, for, first of all, I will say, the reason Jessica is not here today, she is what we would call a walking paraplegic. But unfortunately, now she is a limping paraplegic because she had an accident over the weekend and did something really rough to her leg. So she's being seen today. But the biggest takeaway um, from Jessica is the fact that people that have these severe, complex conditions, it's very difficult for them to be able to manage the process. And that's something that we've taken on. So you look at someone like Jessica, and what most people see is her inability to walk, or did see. Right now, you would never know that she, she was paralyzed. The reality is, it's all the things that are underneath on that iceberg that are really important, like a loss of bowel and bladder function, um, constant, well, she has loss of breathing capacity, constant neuropathic pain, um, opportunities for infection or abound. And ultimately, there's a big psychological battle that takes place and can be very, very costly. So there's a lot to look at over there. Uh, Becky, thank you. Hit, click it one more time. I don't know why this comes out of order. So what we learned from Jessica's experience overall, this is really important, there is no true post-acute standard of care for these patients that fall in those six categories. If you go to 20 different hospitals, you're gonna come out with 20 different care paths. It's really very hit or miss in there. Finding effective treatments and resources, it's all trial and error. I mean, obviously we're, we're changing that, but that's what it was and that's what it continues to be where we're not managing typically. Neuro care must be managed with a neuro-focused lens. It's incredibly important. So if somebody like me, if I get a rash, it's no big deal, maybe I put some cream on it or maybe I don't and that's it. If Jessica or somebody with um, a neuro condition like her, and a spinal cord injury, if she gets a rash, there's a really good chance that's gonna be a pressure sore at $124,000 to treat and a lot of headache for the patient. So it's, it's really important that you have a neurofocused lens. That's why these care management programs that are just generalized don't really help this, this, this group much at all. Um, and the other thing is neuro recovery is lifelong process. It is not episodic in nature. So even though you would say she's recovered, she's not recovered, she can walk. But there are a lot of things that are, are very different and it's, it's important to keep that in mind. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about our solution. 
So we take a programmatic approach to neurological care management. Our goal, the big audacious goal, is to basically create the true post-acute standard of care, and we're doing some great things right now. We want to be able to tell you that if you have this condition, and this is where you are in your recovery, and the care path shows this is what you should be doing next, that you have an 80% better likelihood if you go to this facility versus that facility and walking again. And we're getting there. I'd say we're about a year or two out on the data from those kind of things to be um, super, super confident on, in what that is. So we really, what we do, I'm simplifying a lot here, but I want to throw it into three different baskets. First one is data analytics. I'll talk about all these in just a minute. Next one is neuro-focused teams and tools. And the last one is network optimization. So if you could move forward, Becky, that'd be great. So data analytics, this is really important because if you talk to a payer, they will typically admit pretty quickly that they can't find these patients. And there's a whole host of reasons why this happens. We have our, our algorithm that we built out over the last three years has 80 different data points in it. A Couple of things to give you an idea why they can't find them. First, there's a lot of misclassification. If you have a stroke, it's cardiovascular issue, right? But once you have that stroke, it becomes a neurological condition and it's classified as cardiac, so people are not paying attention to it and are not aware of management. Then, as somebody like Jess, she falls out of the claims data. You would never find her now. You have to string together a bunch of different variables to figure out where they are. And that's where these payers think they don't have a problem, but when we get in there and do a data analysis, they realize this is a really huge problem that we really need to start managing. We put people, everybody's high risk that's in this category, we just stratify them, and that really, the different buckets will give you an idea of how much intervention they need, and it also impacts the cost. So, Becky, okay. Neurofocus teams and tools are very, very important. Um, what we do is everybody has a patient advocate. Those are clinically trained neuro-focused specialists. They've got at least eight years plus of experience in at least neuro, two neuro rehab um, kind of settings. They're the ones that manage the day-to-day -day care of these patients. We also have uh, specifically trained community health workers that go out to, to the community, working with the patient, with their caregivers, to help um, really be the eyes and ears of what we're doing, and they have, can have a, a very big impact. So when you look at what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, really kind of the, the circles follow that along. Initial care assessment, where we start. Um, yeah, I'm a little behind, I, I'll admit. So initial care assessment, basically we do an assess, a bunch of assessments to figure out what's going on with the patient. Then there's also social determinants of health, which tend to be a big issue. We can help address those right away. Once we learn more about the patient and we build trust, then we do the care coordination. They tend to have nine to 10 doctors on average, so we're pulling that data together. When we pull that data together, we're able to put it against evidence-based guidelines and get them on the right care path, which is something that's typically not happening at this point. When we get them on the right care path, then we use our facility finder to let them know the right facility within their network to be able to go to. And if we're doing all those things right, we really can impact STAR and HEDIS ratings, helping to close uh, gaps in care. Uh, the facility finder, I'll breeze through it, incredibly important tool. There's nothing like it in the industry. Basically, uh, we have at least well, well over 600 facilities, neuro rehab facilities profiled, 24 different data points. We know exactly what's going on in there, and we can help put people in the right in-network care that's going to optimize their care. A couple quick things on ROI. Um, there are really three buckets it falls in. The top two I'm going to focus on right now. We can prove these in claims costs. We can save about 15 to 20% in claims costs in these ACSC conditions, which are ones that should be treated in the out, outpatient setting, but they're typically not. And then we also have neuro, um, neuro kind of, what, I'm sorry, associated neurosensitive conditions. These are the ones like that rash I talked about, or if we get a cold, we do nothing. Jess has to go in for a cold because it turns into pneumonia and a, and a week in, in the hospital like that. You have to be able to look with that lens. Those two get, bring about 15 to 20% of savings. The really interesting one is that care path optimization. We can't show that in the data because you would have been down one care path, now you're down a different one. But when you see overall, when you see that um, we saved 20%, we saved 20 in the data, but now the costs are down 30%, where does that come from? You have a pretty good idea, and that's care path optimization. Um, getting close, really close to wrapping up here. Um, this, some payer program results. Our initial customer, a large blue plan out on the West Coast. We started live with them about nine months ago. So we have nine months of data on engagement. 85% of the patients that we've engaged in the program, and we only charge on the ones that are engaged in the program, are still actively, very actively engaged at the nine-month mark. That's, that's a testament to how well we interact with those patients. 
early results, we can only show results for six months because there's something called claims run out, so we don't know yet the nine month mark, but ultimately we're already seeing a 14% delta in savings between like match groups, the ones we're managing versus those that we're not managing, and we expect that to go up probably north of 20%. Um, so, you know, very interesting because we would have expected care to be a little more costly at first and then settle down. So six months at 14% is a really, really great thing. That's when we start to really see those costs go down. Last thing I'll mention is we're so confident in what we do, we're willing to put all fees at risk. So um, you, can, you can move forward. So um, bottom line, I'm just gonna say, people have to be treated with a neurofocused lens. It's really important. These folks can really optimize their outcomes and it's not really happening right now we can have a, a really big impact. And my ask, because I wasn't planning to ask one, uh, but I'll do it now, is that, um, first of all, we're always raising investment. So if anyone would like to discuss that, I would love to talk to them afterwards. From a sales standpoint, I have a big background in, in Medicaid and Medicare. I know an awful lot about the government programs and health plans and everything. If there's anyone that would like to talk and maybe we analyze your data or have a conversation, I would absolutely love to do that afterwards. And I'll say there's probably an opportunity with a lot of business development partners always interested in finding out what's out there. So if you have any questions, uh, let me know and thank you very much. Um. Good job. Uh, I, I'm, I'm living full circle here because I was Jessica's uh, part of her mentor team at Jumpstart when she came out. So oh. <laughs> it's uh, interesting to watch this business evolve from afar um, from that process. So um, I'm still just a little bit unclear about the business model and your value proposition. Are you tech enabled services? You lead with the algorithm and then you do care management for each individual person that you identify, is that how you get paid uh, from the blues in California? Okay, and by the way, we're implementing two new blue plans on top of that right now, so it continues on. We're a tech-enabled service, absolutely. Um, I didn't really even get to touch on our tech. There's a lot of AI in it, sentiment analysis, clinical um, you know, AI, things like that, and they're involved in that. Our business model is we sell to the payer, make that available to the, the individual. First thing we do is, once they come on board, is really try and understand what's going on with them. We do detailed care management on everyone that comes into the program. By claims analysis, we can put them into one of three different buckets, low or level risk, mid or rising risk, the ones that you know are gonna be high next based on it, and then high risk. We charge accordingly a PMPM based on that, and we manage them based on the bucket typically they're in. They can jump buckets. And are quickly. you calling them? I mean, are you physically oh, engaging absolutely. with absolutely. the patient? Absolutely, okay. physically engaging. I mean, we're, we're really trying to get a lot of connection points there. And our patient advocates, the clinically trained ones, are reaching out and doing these things all the time. But we wanted to take it further and put eyes on the patient because there are a lot of patients that eyes make a difference. That's when we started doing the community health worker model to really be able to put that out there. And we cluster. Um, the community health worker when we get the data from the health plan around where we can serve a lot of them at, at one time. Um, but I will tell you, we typically, it, my evolution, I've been in um, healthcare tech for a long time in sales and strategy and everything. Start with a PMPM, do PMPM with some risk potentially in there and eventually move on to full risk, which is what I did when I was with Med Solutions, which is Evacor now. Um, so that's kind of the, the way it's going right now. So we will do some shared savings and eventually we would consider full risk. Um, so I love the passion that I've seen Jessica put into this company since 2013. Uh, I also worked at the Entrepreneur Center at the time and I worked with Jessica some when she launched the company. So it's great to see that her passion has continued the evolution of, it, of what she's done with this team. My question for you is when I look at what is the generation you're looking currently, what is the generation you feel like you're getting the biggest impact? right now? Okay, so that's, it's a tough question. It depends on who, well, first of all, there, there are stroke patients make up 50 plus percent of the population, right? But stroke tends to be more in Medicare Advantage. It tends to be more over there. So it's, to a Medicare Advantage plan, that's the big thing that they wanna focus on, right? We do a lot of other things, but then a plan that's more Medicaid and may have a lot more children might be thinking more about uh, cerebral palsy and things like that. So it depends on who we're targeting what is the focus of our conversation? Because it's, it's important to all groups. Um, it's just finding the right one to talk about. Well, and the reason I say that is when I think about utilized health, the first thing I think about is Jessica's age, the, the young 
20s, 30s, 40s. I don't think so much about the senior living and the senior population. That's going to be the greatest influence in, in our healthcare system over the next five years. When you look at what's going on there, how is there an opportunity for Utilize Health to get that message out, to partner, to be able to impact what we're seeing and driving out the health care cost in the aging population? Okay. There's just a lot of great opportunities there, and I feel like that whole generation, age 60 and over, is going to be overlooked in a lot of different areas, and so everybody's been focused on health care and driving out costs, but yet everybody's forgetting about this influx that's about to happen like a tidal wave of coming in in patients. Okay, obviously you hit the nail on the head with that one. I joined the company about five and a half, six months ago. Um, my background is in all different payers, but I've really put a very heavy Medicare Advantage focus here. So the way we get that message out is, I'm specifically, I know a lot of, I gotta stop doing that. Um, I'm specifically reaching out. I'm pretty well networked within the plan you know, segment. I'm doing all the things with the Medicare Advantage plans and, and the conferences and everything as well. So it's a big focus of what we're doing moving forward. I think when you're young, it's like, who wants to do business with us, right? And we're not there anymore. Now it's about where is the best impact for the time that we spend. And I agree with you completely. So one question. Okay, so no, that's okay. Let me just go through my list. No, just kidding. Um, so for me, how are you, you going to handle scale? Because there's obviously a big piece of this that, that requires a lot of human involvement, yes. right? With touch points. Do you see AI starting to encroach on that? Or what's your plans for managing that going forward? Okay. So we built AI into, we have a whole care management platform I didn't even talk about that's got great AI built in there to help us really triage the ones that need the most attention now. That really helps quite a bit. Um, we built this to scale very quickly. We just signed two new blue contracts. And not that that's necessarily where I think we're gonna end up. I think it's more Medicare Advantage and others that are gonna get bigger. But we've built the scale in there already from a technology standpoint and continue to do so. We have a model where we can actually, and I don't like to say this to a payer, but I'll say it here. Um, we have a model built where we can, from contract signing, literally have them going from that person standpoint in about four to five weeks, where we're hi we've hired all the additional patient advocates we need. We've, we've targeted and built out the community health worker into that segment, so we can do that very quickly. I tell them two to three months, because I know they can't get it done in less than three months, probably, right? But we have that built out, and it's been a, a really seamless model. We just signed a contract recently, and here it's, it's less than a month later. We're almost ready to go live already, so we've, we built that. Sorry that I've gone a little over there. <laughs> I appreciate it. Lots Thank you for your time. Um, Ed, any last questions? Oh, great, great presentation. Okay. Thanks. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lon. That was great. <laughs> All right. Uh, our next company is Bell. Uh, is Armand? Is he around? Uh, uh, Armand Lazan is coming up to present. There he is. <laughs> Testing. Great. Oh, down here? They told me it might work better up here. Okay, go ahead. Awesome. We'll just wait until this gets up. Uh, my name is Armin Lazan. I'm the founder and CEO of Bell. And what we are is a uh, tech enabled network of advanced nail technicians that are preventing diabetic foot ulcers and diabetic amputations uh, by bringing routine foot care or advanced pedicures right into the home. So the, it worked. Uh, so the, the problem in foot health, the biggest problem, is diabetic foot complications. And those are diabetic foot ulcers and amp amputation specifically. So as diabetics become older and their health deteriorates, uh, they lose circulation in their feet, their hands, uh, they develop neuropathy, uh, they can't feel what's happening in their feet, and collectively uh, that means that the, foot or the, health, the health of the foot deteriorates uh, and scratches can turn into infections or ulcers and that ultimately leads to amputations. Almost a million people every year have one of these incidents, it's huge, and it drives a tremendous amount of cost, $38 billion. Um, and not only is the cost absolutely 
is staggering. But what's crazy is that the risk is really, really predictable. We, more, we know more or less who is going to have these incidents. So if you have a history of, a, of an ulcer or an amputation, you have an up to 60% chance of having another one in the next 12 months. And not only is it predictable, but it's really preventable. So there's lots of medical uh, literature out there that says if you just do consistent monitoring, uh, care, and education, you can eliminate 85%. So if it's preventable and predictable, uh, we should be able to eliminate this $38 billion spend uh, but it's not today because the healthcare system is not set up for prevention. Uh, it's either so inconvenient that patients just don't comply, they don't engage in it, uh, it's completely unavailable to them, or it's actually harmful. So these are the three ways. Sorry about that. Yeah. OK. <laughs> It's crazy, it keeps going to the very end of the, the deck here. Okay, so these are the three, the three ways that people get care today. Uh, so first, we see a ton of people go to nail salons for care, and doctors absolutely hate this. Uh, and the problem here is that manicurists, traditional manicurists, are completely untrained on the right techniques to use for diabetics. Uh, so for instance, in a nail salon, they're gonna cut your nail in a curved way that actually increases the chance for an ingrown toenail and an infection. They'll moisturize the feet and they'll go in between the toes. Again, really, really bad. It, that moisture causes bacteria, fungus to grow up, and that's where a lot of infections start. There's a lot of different techniques that play into that, but those are just two examples. Uh, but it's, it's actually harmful. Uh, the second place is primary care. So what we see with PCPs is that they actually hate dealing with the foot. They'll keep uh, socks and shoes on, uh, and they really only take a look if a patient uh, raises their hand and says they have a problem. So when they do uh, see a problem with the foot, they're me basically immediately referring them to the podiatrist. So then the last place is podiatry. And the problem here is that I think there's only about 8,000 podiatrists uh, in the country. It's not nearly enough to care for everyone. Uh, and in some areas, there's actually a three-month wait list. And if you have an infection in your foot and you're waiting for three months, your foot isn't going to make it. Um, and not only that, the process is insanely inconvenient. It's a quick 15-minute service, but people have to go through two hours of logistics to get that service, which, which we will see on the next slide. Perfect. So this is today's uh, care paradigm. This is what people have to go through. Uh, they have to wait for three months to get on a wait list to see a podiatrist. They will leave their home, their workplace, uh, probably miss income uh, opportunities by doing that, travel 20 minutes, sit in a wait room. Uh, they're doing uh, paperwork, paying for the appointment, probably waiting in a second wait room. Then the podiatrist sees them. Uh, see, it, it takes about 15 minutes, and then they're traveling back home. All that means over two hours in time spent, uh, about $75 in out-of-pocket costs, uh, improper care if they're going to the nail salon. It's a dead end at the PCP, and it's frustrating at the podiatrist. So people just don't use this paradigm. So what we're doing is blowing it up and removing everything that's in it that doesn't make sense for the end patient. And we, what we do is we take an advanced nail technician and bring them right into the home and provide the care there. So what that means is that uh, the service takes 20 to 60 minutes. Um, it, when a payer pays for it, it's absolutely free. And there's no financial barrier uh, for patients. It's private care, which is incredibly important for this demographic. Uh, they're very embarrassed by their feet because they're not in good shape. Uh, and especially for men who drive the vast majority of these complications. Um, and it's engaging care. Uh, our customers actually really, really enjoy the service. They look forward to it every single month. Um, they, uh, we infuse the best parts of the nail salon into it, um, and that, that's really, really important. 92% of our customers come back to us every single month. Uh, and then finally, it's advanced care. So all of our nail technicians are licensed. They're advanced certified. We provide them with the exact equipment and supplies that's perfect for this, uh, and we have a very specific uh, appointment protocol, which should be on the next slide. There we go. So our appointment is designed to promote foot health uh, and to ultimately prevent 85% of these complications from happening. And we break it up into four categories. Uh, so first, inspection. The first thing that the nail technician does when going into the home uh, before providing service is thoroughly inspecting the foot. 
the top, the bottom, in between the toes, making sure that it's safe for us to provide the service. We also will inspect footwear. Just properly sized and good condition footwear can cut these things in half, the, 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 uh, the incidents in half. Uh, the second piece is uh, care. So again, avoiding all the harmful nail salon techniques, uh, cutting the toenail directly. Uh, we dry in between the toes with gauze uh, at the end of every single appointment. Uh, and again, I can't stress enough how important engagement and making people feel comfortable is. Superior comfort means superior uh, compliance, which means superior prevention. Uh, and then finally, monitoring and intel. So when we do find an issue, if we do find one, uh, we'll photograph it, write it up, and send it to the patient or, or, uh, or their doctor to help them get the fastest uh, care and the best care possible. And just finding an ulcer when it's a level one, which is less severe, versus a level three, which is deep and in the bone, that's a cost difference of about $20,000. So even if we can't prevent all of them, uh, if we can get them to care faster, you can dramatically reduce costs in that way. So on the next slide, uh, this is how the health system uh, is thinking about this. And we're targeting uh, specifically payers or value add uh, health systems. Uh, so without Bell, um, you know, they might have a thousand high risk members who we more or less know are going to have a, a foot issue in the next year. 40% might have a diabetic foot ulcer, 5% might have an amputation. An ulcer is about $13,000, an amputation more than 100000 So for a thousand high risk folks, probably spending $10 million. If we take those thousand members, put them into our preventive care program, we can reduce up to 85%. We're showing 70% here, but more or less driving the cost down from 10 million to 3 million. So overall, on the next slide, uh, there is a huge cost saving opportunity here. So one payer in one state or uh, in a region of state might have 1,000 a, a folks. If we see those people, that's $7 million in savings. Uh, and that's about a, a 6.3 times ROI. Uh, but beyond that, there's also a moral uh, imperative here to do this because the mortality rates with ulcers and amputations is 11% and 22% respectively. So basically, if we're serving th this many people in a year, we're saving 38 lives. And no one should die because they don't have access to really cost-effective, straightforward, simple care. So uh, I guess I'll conclude with the ask being, uh, we're working with payers and other value add uh, uh, health system uh, partners to implement our program. Um, and uh, we're also looking at ways to work with CMS and HHS to make sure that our program is uh, within the regulatory framework and whatnot. Um, so those are two major things we're working on right now. So thank you. Uh, good presentation. So the first question was related to your last. Uh, I don't believe Medicare and Medicaid reimburse for this service today on a home health visit. Is that correct? Yes, so there's, there, is some, there is an opportunity to. So the way it works today is that podiatrists will actually many times employ advanced nail technicians in the brick and mortar setting to do this. It's rare, but it's done. Um, so what we're figuring out is how do we take that structure and allow that to be done uh, at arm's distance uh, away from the brick and mortar in, in the, con in, in the uh, context of the, of, the, of the customer. Right. And uh, one other technical question. In the therapy portion of what you're trying to do, uh, have you looked at any oxygenation techniques? Uh, no, not yet. No. Uh, well, I love that you're focusing on this because I'm going to go right back to the aging population and yeah. when I've got a stepfather that's experiencing uh, the same type of issues with his podiatrist and everybody that can help him with his neuropathy. Um, when I look at what we have to deal with, again, in the elderly care and in, in, in that particular genre there of, you know, the aging, how are you addressing that when you think about you know, a lot of people, they perceive that, well, that's just part of the aging, that's just part of growing old. How are you going to address that and go in and, and try to make a difference and impact that? Yeah. And for the elderly folks, that is the, we're adding so much value there right now today. So we work with about eight senior communities around Middle Tennessee and provide these services to the residents there. And it's not just diabetics, it's all, I mean, foot health is a huge problem, huge problem. It's like the stepchild of, of healthcare in many ways. Uh, but we, I've personally seen people throw off their shoes in these communities, and their nails are growing into their feet yeah. sometimes. 
And, and if you're not diabetic and then have a second risk factor with diabetes, health, it's not covered by insurance. So these people don't know how to get care or cost-effective care. Uh, and what we're doing is keeping costs as low as possible so that they can buy it out of pocket now. But I think that's what diabetic foot complications is the place to start with this business because that's where all the value and the costs are being driven. But in the long vision of the company, what I see is going beyond high risk diabetics to medium risk diabetics to low risk diabetics to older folks who just need it to protect their mobility, to protect their long term health because once someone loses their foot, it's, an, it's over. You have five years left to live. You lose, we lose 22% of folks. Uh, the year they have that amputation, it's terrible. So it's a huge, huge problem, and seniors are, are really the core of it in, in many, many ways. So not so much a, a question as more of a thought starter for you to, to consider, and that's I noticed that you were looking at taking pictures of the feet uh, at mm -hmm. the point that they were complete and so forth. I think that may be something you want to take a look at in a much deeper sense and start using some of the new vision techniques yes. to really kind of get a better sense of what the ideal foot looks like. And, and maybe maybe get you to more of a prescriptive pattern, especially with the aging community and everything, so you're not having to visit. Maybe they can take the picture and you can get instant feedback. Yeah. So oh, absolutely. Nice. It, yeah. yeah, where we are with a 1.0 versus where we could be at a 3, 4.0, it's huge. Just tracking how the foot looks over time, you can identify problems yeah. and really automate a lot of that and find yeah, things just before. The sooner you yeah. can start that catalog of pictures, yeah. the sooner you're gonna be able to, because really you're gonna need that early uh, uh, those early images to really start to drive the value there. Sure. So. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. I like the business model. I like the simplicity of it. Um, I, I say keep it simple. You know, build some growth and and uh, yeah, this is really neat. You know, the, the obviously reimbursement is going to be an issue for you. Um, that could change. Uh, that could change. Okay. You know, especially with the private payers, once they see the value, I mean, you're you're indicating some pretty significant value, and I see yep. footnotes that I can't read, but I'm I'm assuming it's, um, you know, predicated on evidence, which is mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, and I, you know, stay persistent with that. You know, that part of it, make it very evidence based and, you know, actuarial, if you will. Yep. Yeah. Great job. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Armin. And last, but certainly not least, uh, my health direct, and we'll bring up uh, Mary Tackberry and Richard Moore. And uh, so good luck with the clicker. <laughs> good luck. You stole my punchline. Oh, sorry. <laughs> my name is Richard Moore. I'm with um, um, my health direct. I am an account executive. Um, and I was actually asked to come here because every Shark Tank has two people. So we figured it in a second person. So I will be basically nodding as she, uh, as Mary presents. You're nudging me. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Mary Tackman, and I'm a director with my health direct on the health plan side of the business. Um, my health direct is technically not a startup, and we're also not going to be talking so much about clinical. This is going to be kind of a very different view today. Um, we're going to speak specifically about um, technology that assists in improving quality for health plans, pri primarily Medicaid and Medicare plans. It, uh, Let's see next word. slide. There we go. I think we'll let um, the gentleman next in the slide. corner control. He's got it. Okay. okay. No, no. So, right there. just so you know, at Medicaid and Medicare, the best thing that's happened in my opinion in the last 10 years is that there are great incentives and great programs now that the HEDA scores and the Haas cap scores and all of that is tied to the reimbursement and the star ratings and the pay for performance. We're seeing huge improvements as a result of the economics coming together with the quality and what we have is a new tool in the quality toolkit for these health plans. Um, the best way, next slide, the best way for you to get it is to, for me to give you an example of a couple patients and, and members and what their life is like, and you'll get it. Uh, Joan here is with her daughter, Sophie. She's a 10 care member. She lives in Memphis. She's on her way to work, and um, she's running late. She's like all of us. She's busy. She has a daughter in her arms that she has to drop off at her mother's on the way to work. And she gets, a, and, and the health plan, meanwhile, has data about her. 
They know that she has, her child is late for the well child visit. She also knows that her, ch that she, um, the health plan knows that she needs cervical cancer screening. So their job and part of the role is to help Joan do the right thing, which is really to go to get an appointment with her provider to close these gaps in care. In this particular example, if the health plan has just called Joan and she's walking out the door, probably what she will say is, thank you for calling me. Yeah, I know I need to do these things. I can't talk right now, goodbye. And so she's off and running. And then what happens? Everyone has to rely on Joan. Joan has to do it herself. When she, maybe later at night, or not at night, because the health, the provider isn't open at night, she has to wait for the next day or when she gets around to it to make that appointment. And oftentimes the appointment never gets made unless she feels it's really important. And she probably will do it first for her child before she'll go to her, her cervical cancer screening. Another example on the next slide is Uni. And Uni is a Medicare Advantage member. She's not quite so busy as Joan. She's probably got brownies that she just put in the uh, oven. She gets a call, and in this case, the health plan has done their analytics. They know she's a diabetic. They know she needs an HbA1c and that she's overdue for her annual visit with her PCP. And so when they're calling and they're going to say to Uni, hey, did you know you need these things? Yeah, yeah, I, I know I need to do it. OK. Um, well, we, in this case, Many health plans have call centers and they have representatives that can actually facilitate the process of getting an appointment. How that works would be essentially uni would hear what you need to do. Can I help you? I can actually get the provider on the line right now and you can get an appointment. If uni says yes, then what happens next is that uh, the health plan representative would say, oh, let me put you on hold for a couple, for 30 seconds. And then I'll call the provider and when together we'll get this appointment. This is done all the time in healthcare today and it's the three-way call. And, and that might take 15 minutes if everybody hangs in there for it to happen. And then finally, what happens is you have an appointment that has been created. Um, not the optimal situation. There's problems with this. A lot of times the appointments never get made. The, uh, what happens often in the call centers is that they get the provider on the line or they call the provider and it's 12.30 and they get a message, I'm sorry, we're at lunch. Because providers still go to lunch and close their practice. Or they, they get put on hold. So there's a lot of problems with all of this and those calls take 15 to 17 minutes. So what has my health direct done to solve these problems? In the next slide. We've created a digital network, and the digital network essentially is a network where the providers and the payers partner up and work collaboratively together. Um, we, the, the clients, the health plans, Medicaid or Medicaid, go out to the, the providers, have a discussion with them, and say, we'd like you to put up some inventory available Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 9 to 11 that we can book appointments. Um, without having to call you. And so that goes into the digital network that My Health Direct has. And so the people in the call center now have a network that they can book into bye-bye three-way call. Okay? Now a call can be done in six minutes. The member's happy, the appointment's made, they show up more often, and um, more gaps in care are closed quicker. So that's kind of um, what that's all about. We're working with um, several large health plans and they also find the analytics they get out of this is invaluable because they don't have a view right now into what's going on with the scheduling and this gives them a view into what appointments are being made, how many, who's showing up um, and, and all of that, that that right now they have no idea about that. Um, and then finally, next slide, the, the, if you looked at Joan there on her way out, do you think she'd ever really take time to do a three-way call to get an appointment? Probably not. So we're real excited. What we've done in the last year is innovate and create the ability to connect an outbound outreach where you're reminding someone via text for an appointment 
for them to actually do the appointment right then. So you connected those dots. So now what, you, what we're able to do is reach out to members through a health plan where they could send a text message to 50,000 people who need mammograms and within a few minutes and within an hour, 5,000 5, people would have that appointment already booked. Not just a reminder to book it, but that it could be booked. We're seeing that um, we've, we've been uh, working on this over the last year, and we're really, I was skeptical. I didn't think it would necessarily work, but uh, a lot of people are doing it. They want to, and even through an uh, automated call, are scheduling appointments. Um, as client executive, it's my job once that Mary delivers the SOW and the contract is for me to implement and deploy it. So I, I'm here to tell a story, but instead of me telling a story, I want to ask Sherry, Moreland, and Katie Sanders to come forward. They're our most recent deployment here in Tennessee with Blue Care, and I want to give them a chance to kind of tell their story. Um, we got, what, 20 minutes left? Because it's a great story. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm sorry I talked too long. That's okay. <laughs> Sherry is, 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 is the director of member engagement, and Katie is the manager of member engagement. All right. so you got Thank it. you. So Richard asked us to come, and uh, basically our partnership with My Health Direct uh, started when our senior medical director went to the Medicaid Innovations Forum in Orlando last year and he came back and he said, Sherry, I've got to tell you about this solution. I think it's really going to help you with your calls because we have staff um, that are embedded within our company. We don't put it out to vendors. Um, we make the calls ourselves every day to our Medicaid members um, that have gaps in care as well as other things like new member welcome calls, maternity calls, things like that. And so when you make over a million calls, calls a year, you're looking for a solution that would really help you uh, do your job better. So Dr. Huffman, he came back and he's like, you've really got to look at this. I'm like, okay, okay. And he's like, I really think that we can use this, but I'm going to tell you, they're going to have to integrate a transportation solution for us too, because with Medicaid, our members have access to transportation. And so oftentimes when we're making a call to our members to schedule an appointment, we end up having to schedule a transportation as well. So we worked with My Health to also integrate that into the system. So really for the value for us, uh, we identified who our largest provider partners are in our network. And right now we're still in the middle of a pilot, so we're heavily concentrated in Memphis. We've identified uh, really four large groups in Memphis that have the bulk of the gaps in care. We've gone out to them. Katie's done all the legwork. She's like the, our implementation lead, and, and she'll talk a little bit about that if we have time. I'm trying to go really fast. Um, but um, we've partnered with them. We know what their practice rules are, so we have a, probably better insight into these practices than we've ever had before. We know which doctors work on which days. We know the times of day that they want to allow us to book appointments for. We know if they work extended office hours, if they work on Saturdays. We also have the capability to work on the weekends now. We've never had that before because the provider doesn't have to be there. Um, we can also call through lunch times. We're not trying to reach the provider during our lunch. So in, in the past, you know, we were limited by what we, we had. Uh, but now, because we have My Health in our toolbox, we can really work pretty much all the time, although my staff <laughs> doesn't want us to. Um, we also um, pretty much have eliminated the three-way call because oftentimes we're calling, hey, hold on, or, you know, the office is closed and so forth, so we don't have to deal with that anymore. And then the transportation experience, if we schedule transportation for the member, that's a quick email over to our transportation vendor, whereas that would have been another three-way call. And then um, the data. Um, I'm going to let Katie talk a little bit about the data that we're really getting to dig our fingers into and, and really uh, comb through and figure out what's, what's some barriers and what are some additional opportunities. Katie? Absolutely. And as you can tell, Sherry and I are going to get really excited, so I'm going to try to go really quickly. But there's um, two major pieces of data that we've been able to um, have insight through the My Health Direct tool. Um, the first one that I get really excited about is we did our first community outreach event. Um, a couple weeks ago 
And that is when we have an event at a provider's office. We invite a ton of members in. We have um, games and activities so that we can bring everybody in, um, make transportation very easy to get to. Um, we've never had any insight on um, when we call to schedule that appointment versus their show rate. Um, after the event, we looked at that data from the My Health Direct platform, and we noticed that we had a 77% show rate for members we called more than 20 days before the event, where we only had like a 10% show rate for members we called less than 10 days before the event. That was a huge eye-opener for us. We would always think that, you know, the closer to the event we called, we'd get a better show rate. Um, the other thing um, is um, the show rates to the provider's office in general. Um, so right now, before My Health Direct, we had about 120 days that we had to wait before we would get claims data to see if a member actually showed to an appointment. Those are now real time. We can see the day of the appointment if the member showed up, and then we can take immediate action, um, reach out to that member, try to find out what the barrier was that they didn't attend their appointment, um, close those gaps sooner without having to wait. Um, and then I guess finally I would say that um, working with My Health Direct, we've identified a lot of um, additional enhancements and they've been great to work with us and we're really excited about some of the new stuff that, that we're working with them on and it's been a huge, a huge game changer in our ability to, to meet our members' needs. That's it? Yeah. Okay. Questions? Applause. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so a couple of general comments before I get started. First of all, Hugh would like to know the lady in Memphis because she has a Michael Kors uh, bag <laughs> and is wearing a Gucci suit, so I'm not thinking no. she's on Medicaid. Just <laughs> <laughs> going out on a limb there. We're checking that out right Actually, now. Actually, so. that's, that's a stereotype that, well, yeah, I'm coaching, but women work and wear suits to work that are on Medicaid. <laughs> Okay, lost a little credibility with me there, right there. So, um, uh, an overall comment. So, uh, one of the things we're going to do at Tennessee Hymns with Eric and Tommy is uh, uh, offer some mentorship uh, with each of the companies presenting here today uh, as part of our contribution to the community. If anybody wants to take us up on that, contact one of us. Um, overall, today, several of you, while you were pitching, went over, made apologies, all of that. Practice, 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 mm -hmm. right? 90% uh, of the time you go to an investor in Nashville, they're going to tell you, don't, don't even put up the PowerPoint, just tell me what you're doing and talk me through mm -hmm. the numbers, right? And so if you're not ready for that and you're apologizing about your clickers and all that, you know, give it up. I had to follow Bon Jovi at Health Data Palooza about six years ago uh, with a thousand people, no fun. So just, you know, uh, take that for what it is. Um, I, I, I like your model a lot. I think uh, digital patient scheduling is a huge advantage. Um, awesome job on the testimonials, having live testimonials. Amazing, never seen that before, so uh, kudos for that. So. Okay. No, I'll be brief, and, and I echo some of the things Todd said. A couple things in your presentation, you know, clear, concise, and what you're doing. Make sure you really get that up, up front. I would shorten my entrance mm -hmm. into that in my presentation if I were you. You did a great job, it's just it did get a little lengthy there and I got a little lost. Uh, maybe that's just me and my ADD, I don't know. But um, the other thing I would say is when you're going into this presentation, give me a workflow. Show me what you're doing, okay? Mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're talking and going through this, it would have been great to see a visual uh, of the workflow of what you're doing mm -hmm. and what, how you're scheduling. That would be good to have. Then the third thing I would say is you got to look at how do you get enough of this manual uh, interaction out on the front end. Use those important and valued resources only for the most critical conversations. I would be looking at data, AI, I'd be leveraging that, and I would use bots and I would figure out how I integrate mm -hmm. that into my uh, solution. So what she said. No. Um. Okay. So I think, you know, I, I, just going back to the presentation, I think I did get a little bit lost in the beginning because you talked about the mother and child and then you talked about the senior mm -hmm. and then you went into what the senior did and then you went into what the mother and child might, you know, what the mother might be able to do. I think if you'd start with the senior, gone into what they would do by the call center and then you go to the mother child and say, now we're going, going to do texting and IVR, I think it, it really resonated a little bit better yeah. with the audience. Uh, I think it I just kind of sets yeah. it up a little bit better, yeah. that's all. I think, you know, overall it, it's, 
you know, this is uh, certainly a challenging area for a lot of people, right? And I think driving through is, is, uh, is certainly valuable. I think the only other question I might have, and not necessarily asking for an answer, but something others might think of, is how, how does that call center select those providers? Right, how do you know which providers to select at what points and how are you making sure mm -hmm. that you're following any, any rules mm -hmm. or, or any lay of the land that might be right. out there, so. And I can tell you just from our health plan, the way we approach the providers, we looked at our data, our claims data, and our gap data. And so we identified if we concentrate <coughs> in a specific area, if we targeted our providers that have the largest gaps in care, who really carry the weight in our quality scores, would by us wrapping our arms around these practices and providing that support to them help them close gaps? Okay. And so that, that's how mm -hmm. we did. Typically, Medicaid plans often go to federal qualified health centers mm -hmm. where they, they have a network in that community, and it's, it has worked really well. So you're selling exclusively to plans? Well, um, this uh, there's two sides of our business. We have okay. a health system side okay. that provides this technology for mm -hmm. self-scheduling um, in in health systems. Okay. Yes. Because I, I I heard undertones of referral management, centralized scheduling, or or uh, collaborative scheduling, mm -hmm. online scheduling, um, and then I heard about you know workflows and workflow management. Is that fair? Is that a fair yeah. assessment of your functionality? On the, uh, yeah. On the, on, and on the health system side, uh, it's it's. It, it's similar, but different. Do you have challenges around, you know, organizations that just aren't, you know, because their culture or the maturity of the organization, they're just not up for the task of doing scheduling? I mean, you know, a lot, of, it seems like um, they're, well, I won't name names, but there's a very large, well-known health system, right? Um, nationally known health system and very good health system that cannot figure scheduling out. And if, it seems to me like if you can't figure that part out, you, there's an issue, you know, and uh, it probably make you, it make it difficult for you to operate in that particular locality probably, right? Right, and um, health systems are at whole different levels of interest in self-scheduling and, and how to yeah. do it depending on what their current practice management system is and, and scheduling. Um, we're finding, though, that there's more and more an interest driven mainly by consumers saying we want this. We want to be able to schedule an appointment. We don't want to have to call mm -hmm. the provider to do great. it. All right. Speaking okay. Of, thanks. Uh, thank you, mentors, very much. Uh, great questions. <laughs> thank you, Ed and Anna and, and uh, all of our hosts and uh, all, of you, all of the guests. This is uh, Hopefully you can see the excitement that's, that's here in Nashville and the, and the innovation that's really coming here. And I've seen these in the, uh, multiple uh, times and I, I get excited again every time I hear. So uh, with that, we'll turn it over to Haley Hogan. And thank all of you for coming today. Um, I think we're giving you about 30 minutes back in your day. Um, but we have this location until about five tonight. So if people wanna just hang out, uh, meet other people, say hi, talk to our friends from HHS. Um, I encourage you to take the time to do that. You have some of that time. Um, I do apologize for some AV issues. Um, we worked to fix it and it just never worked out. But um, thanks for all who, who participated in today. It really meant a lot. Um, we really appreciated the opportunity to bring the community together. Um, I mentioned before, we couldn't do this without sponsors. So I wanna thank our supporting sponsor, HCA TriStar. Our associate sponsors, Am Surge, Sherard, Rowe, Voigt, and Harbison. And finally, Launch Tennessee um, in recognition of their contribution to the SBIR matching program. Um, and once again, um, I have to thank all of the community partners that worked so hard to make this possible today, because um, it does take a village to do this type of thing. I do think we're incredibly lucky to live here um, where people work together very well. So thank you to the Nashville Entrepreneur Center, to the Nashville Technology Council, to the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce, to Tennessee Hymns, to Center for Medical Interoperability, and finally, Life Science Tennessee. And I would be remiss in not saying thank you hugely to the Healthcare Council team also who worked their tails off as well, my team, to make this possible. Um, it 
really is incredible to work with such an amazing group of people on a daily basis. So I hope everyone here was inspired by what you heard today. I know I was. Um, please keep thinking about ways we can make healthcare better. Um, and working together, I do think that we can do that here. So thank you all. Have a wonderful day. And we will see you at the next one. Thanks.